Welcome, Donna. Can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me, Sarah? Yep, we can. Thank you for helping me out with that. I appreciate it. No problem. It. <laughs> Having a little bit of technical difficulties today, it looks like. Seeing that it's two, um, I'm going to kick off the meeting. It's it's great to see everyone. It's been a couple months since we last met back in December, um, but it's great to gather everybody together again and um, and talk about um, our progress um, or the process that we have ahead of us this year. Um, we're holding today's webinar, um, today's meeting via webinar as a matter of safety and to enable broader participation from across the state. And I will hand it over to Farah Anderson from Cadmus to walk us through some of the logistics mm -hmm. uh, for today's meeting, particularly because I think we have a few new council members joining us um, at this meeting. Farah? Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and so I think we can go to the uh, slide that is on this meeting procedures topic. Um, so as always, to ensure a smooth and um, robust discussion, uh, just a few reminders. Um, I think most, most of us are used to this at this point, but um, to just go through, first of all, um, CAC members uh, should be on mute. Um, at, Everyone should be on mute when not speaking. Um, and if you need to, to sort of see cues for any of these things that we're talking through, um, some of these key functions are uh, noted in the um, illustrations on the slide. Video is encouraged for CAC members in particular uh, when you're speaking. And so you can turn that on and off um, as you need to. Again, given bandwidth issues, um, it, you may choose to have that off for some of the time. Um, as you would like to share your comments and questions, um, CAC members, please use the hand raise function. Um, it's sort of that second visual on the slide here uh, to indicate that you'd like to speak. Um, we, led by Sarah, will then call on you um, as needed. And uh, once once you've shared your comment, um, please lower your hand. Um, and of course, mute and unmute uh, as you're needing to do so in order to share your comment. If any additional technical issues arise, um, you can contact the email address listed on the screen, nys.cac at cabinetsgroup.com, and we will support you behind the scenes as needed. Um, and so with that, I will pass back to Sarah and the co-chairs. Thank you, Farah. Let's turn to calling roll to see which members of the council are in attendance today. Would Nyserta's Valerie Milanovic call roll? Certainly. Good afternoon, everyone. Co-Chair Harris. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Co-Chair Sagos. Good afternoon, everybody. Commissioner Ball. Good afternoon. On behalf of Commissioner Bassett, Gary Ginsburg. Right here. Thank you. Chair Christian. Present. Thank you. You're welcome. Donna DeCarolis. Good afternoon, everyone. At, on behalf of Commissioner Dominguez, Carolyn Ryan. Present, thank you. Gavin Donahue. Good afternoon, thank you. CEO Driscoll. Hi, everyone. Dennis Elsenbeck. Here. CEO Falcone. Good afternoon. Rose Harvey. We'll circle back. I didn't notice Rose earlier. Bob Howarth. I'm here. Thank you. Peter Iwanowitz. I'm here. Thanks. President Knight. Present. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Commissioner Reardon. Good afternoon. Ann Reynolds. Present. Thank you. On behalf of Secretary Rodriguez, Keisha Santiago Martinez. Good afternoon, everyone. Raya Salter. Good afternoon, thank you. Dr. Shepson. We'll come back. Commissioner Visnauskas. Okay, we'll try uh, Rose Harvey one more time. I know there were some technical difficulties, so I'll just go around one more time on folks that I didn't hear from. Rose, no? And Dr. Shepson. 
Commissioner Visnauskas. Well, we'll keep an eye out for them, but council co-chairs, I note the presence of a quorum for today's Climate Action Council meeting. Well, thank you, Val, and, and again, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to see you again as we launch what we'll, you'll see today is, is shaping up to be a very busy 2022 together. So as to the agenda today, you can see that we're going to be truly spending um, the majority of our time together laying out a plan for 2022. Um, we certainly do have a lot of work to do and want to be organized from the start, uh, certainly. So as you can see here, we will start with consideration of the minutes from our last meeting. And then Basil and I as co-chairs will share some remarks. And then again, the the bulk of the, the day will be spent um, walking through our plan for 2022 and receiving important input from you as we um, forge, forge through this year together. Next slide, please. So let's proceed with consideration of the minutes from the last meeting. Uh, the council members did receive the draft minutes with their meeting materials. Are there any discussion items on the minutes from December 20th, 2021? Hearing none, um, we can move to, oh, sorry. I was trying to raise my hand, sorry. No, it's fine, Gavin. Go ahead, Donna. Sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. I was trying to raise my hand, but but I wanted to raise one item um, relative to the minutes. First of all, I do want to say whoever produces them does a really great job because they're very, they do a good job of capturing a lot of discussion. So thank you for that. But one item I want to raise because um, we had last minute changes to chapter 18. We all recall on December 20th, there was a lot of discussion. Um, one specific change made that I want to highlight because I want to make sure we're all uh, aware of it and I'm concerned about it is the change of the term natural gas um, and renaming it as fossil gas. And I'm, and I'm raising it for just a couple reasons. Um, one is it's it's not a term that's been used elsewhere in, um, it, to my knowledge, and I've been in the industry a long time. Um, you know, it's not in the public service law. It's not in our contracts for pro procuring gas supplies. I mean, it's a commodity traded on the New York Mercantile exchange. So, so it's an area of concern that I wanted to flag. Um, certainly, that chapter um, and the edits, it was a non consensus approval. Um, and I want to raise it because, frankly, I think it could be confusing to customers. And it's, it's just something that now we're going to have in a state document. Um, and, and it's really not defined. And then we go on to talk about fossil uh, infrastructure, and that's not defined either. So, I'm raising it as a, as a concern. Uh, not an inaccuracy, but a concern about um, the edit. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Donna. Um, Gavin, were you planning to make it the same uh, point or a different point? Yeah, I've had I've had some you know time to reflect on the gas section of this, um, and and I agree with everything Donna said. And then the, the comment relative to the minutes for me is it identified three folks voting negative. Uh, on the minute uh, on the change that Bob proposed. Um, I just would like the minutes to be amended to say who those 3 people are. I know I'm one of them. I know Donna is, and I think Dennis was the 3rd. Um, because I have the same concerns Donna has, um, that I think we've, we've, we've gone too far with this drafting, uh, without proper. Oversight by the public service commission and its staff about their legal role and their jurisdiction. So. Um, I don't want to get too much into the substance. Um, this is a motion in about the minutes, Dorian, and I get that. I would just like to be identified by name as a negative vote. Thank you both. Um, so this was the item, just in case others need to be caught up, I understand this is the item that Bob had put forth and that was voted on. Um, I want to confirm that the three are reflected correctly, or reflect, I have no personal issue with reflecting um, the three votes as noted. Um, Val, would you agree that that the minutes can be amended as such? Uh, certainly, and uh, I actually was going to ask a clarifying question as to whether or not on on any of the other votes should we also um, acknowledge, you know, who voted in which direction. I could do that by way of footnotes. Um, I could do that in the body of the minutes, whatever the preference of the council is. I was just suggesting being consistent in our yes, approach. I agree. I agree. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
can I ask if any member would object to that approach to the minutes just to reflect the 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 nature of of each vote that was taken and and those who voted um, accordingly. Okay, hearing none, um, I think the best approach is to just make that change universally throughout the minutes. And um, thank you, Donna and Gavin, for bringing that up. Thank you. In any other um Dor Dorian, I've had my hand up for bits, Bob. I'm very sorry. I'm trying I I I'm That's getting okay. back into my routine here. Hold on. All sorry. right. Yes, please. I, I uh, just want to respond uh briefly and I, I agree that the minutes well well reflect the meeting. On on the issue of, of fossil gas, we did of course discuss that in the meeting and we agreed to it. I want to be clear on that in the record. Uh and also the, the reason that I specifically proposed those changes was to be consistent first with the panel recommendations. The panel recommendations going back, I believe, uh, as far as April of last year, uh, particularly from the Housing and Energy Efficiency Panel, were calling strongly for that change. And the, the rest of our draft implementation plan, in fact, made that change. And so the draft of Chapter 18 that we were discussing finally on December 20th was the the sole holdout and part of my logic uh, in proposing that change, which again, we did endorse strongly as a council was consistency with the panel recommendations and across uh, the other chapters. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Um, I also see Dennis has his hand raised. Um, did you have something to add Dennis? Yeah, thanks. I, again, um, you know, being someone who came from the utility industry, I, I, you know, I know we talked about the fossil versus natural gas, but we're now going into the public side of the of the of this process, and uh, I really think we ought to keep with natural gas. It is what people understand; it's what people know. Uh, we shouldn't be like rephrasing and then retraining people. I just, you know, uh, it just. I just think we got to keep this simpler and not keep adding more complexity to the conversation. Thank you, Dennis. Um, you know, I think actually, well, first of all, I think we can all agree that the vote was what it was um, back in December. Um, however, I will I will tell you in, in one major <laughs> area that that you'll hear from Sarah about uh, and the team leader today is really this very topic and really where we believe we as a council can be working over the coming year um, together. Um, to to address what is one of the biggest topics right before us. So, so I think um, it is not to say that we've reached the end of the end of the road on that by any means. And and I'm personally interested to hear from each of you as to how we can can move these topics forward in 2022. So um, I appreciate everyone's input on the minutes. Um, Donna, your hand is raised. Did you have something additional to say, or should we proceed? Sorry, Doreen, that was probably the hand I tried to raise before, so apologies. <laughs> there we go. Have, all Thank me, you. all me. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. So, so with those amendments as um, described by Val, um, I'd like to move to approve the minutes from our last Climate Action Council meeting on December 20th, 2021. So I'll first ask for a motion to approve the minutes, please. So moved. And a second. 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 Thank you. Um, does anyone disapprove of the minutes as amended? Alrighty. Since no opposition was expressed, the minutes are adopted and will be posted to the Climate Action Council's website. And with that, uh, thank you all. And I uh, will turn to the next slide and I'll hand it over to my co-chair to begin um, a few remarks and reflections. Dorian, thanks, and hello, everybody. It's great to see you all. Hope your new year is going okay so far. Uh, I'll be brief, just a few uh, updates. Obviously, everyone's mind right now is on the war in Ukraine, uh, rightly so, and we all don't know what direction that's going to go um, and how it will impact all of us and uh, and the work that we're doing on a regular basis as well as our, our daily lives. Um, we also have, uh, of course, seen the IPCC report just come out, I think uh, Doreen will talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, certainly a grim forecast that we all need to be concerned about. Uh, I also just want to quickly recognize the work of the Climate Justice Working Group. I mean, they've been working extraordinarily hard behind the scenes um, on a range of topics. We'll get into some of that today. Um, 
you know, they've been de developing the disadvantaged communities criteria and of course been working directly with us on, on our plan. And, and um, you know, that is, as you know, the heart of this law, um, the uh, issue of disadvantaged communities and, uh, and turning that, uh, those fortunes around uh, with the work that we do. So um, I wanted to uh, make that point up front. Um, along those lines, some good news. Next slide, please. I like to lead with some good news. Um, very happy and honored to have an amazing new addition to DEC. Our very first Deputy Commissioner for Equity and Justice, Adriana Espinoza, who comes to us from uh, New York City, was in the mayor's office, and um, will be uh, at DEC doing uh, really two big jobs. One, diversity within the agency, inclusivity, um, and two, uh, working uh, with our great environmental justice office and uh, making sure that we have uh, the right policies and procedures in place uh, for all the work that we do. So huge job. She'll be working with uh, directly with Alana, who you'll know very well, um, and Samir, of course, on the uh, on the uh, CAC on uh, on any issues that, that pertain to climate justice. But I just wanted to welcome her. She's going to uh, boost our abilities in a significant way. Uh, next slide, please. And you will also hear briefly from her today as well. So she'll have a chance to weigh in on things. Um, Climate Act milestones. Uh, very briefly, you all know what we did last year. I think we covered most of this in, in many of the, uh, the previous meetings. Again, a very busy year. Uh, the Disadvantaged Communities Report. We did the draft scoping plans we talked about, the Just Transition Working Group, the Job Study, uh, the new statewide uh, greenhouse gas emissions report, and of course, the two regulations that we were able to put out last year. Um, Next week, we expect to put to expect to put out the disadvantaged communities criteria and maps. So just a flag to you all uh, that should be uh, out next week and uh, we'll find a way to to uh, remind you all when that does go online. Uh, but again, a, a really busy 2021 produced some great outcomes uh, An exciting uh, state of the state and budget from the governor in regards to climate and environment. Um, and continued amazing work out of uh, DEC and other, or, D or NYSERDA, I should say, and, and our partner agencies on, on a range of really important issues. And with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, back over to uh, Doreen. Doreen. Yes, thanks, Basil. Um, next slide, please. I too want to welcome Adriana. We're just thrilled to be working with you in your new capacity. Um, it's 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 great you're on board. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that three additional Climate Action Council members have joined. Um, we have Rose Harvey, Ruth Ann Vestauskas, and Paul Shepson, who have now joined the meeting. So welcome uh, to each of you. Uh, so, certainly before I get into some of the highlights of our State of the State and the executive budget, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the recently released Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, i.e. IPCC Sixth Assessment Report, known um, Impacts, Adaptation, and Vulnerability. And this report represents and presents key findings of the working group two contributions to the sixth assessment report of the IPCC and is focused this time on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. So much like prior IPCC reports, they are calls to action and update forecasts for the causes and effects of climate change. And this report is no different. It also paints a stark picture for humanity, warming that warning that climate change risks are greater than thought. And in fact, the final two sentences of this new report really say it all. And I quote, the scientific evidence is unequivocal. Climate change is a threat to human well-being and the health of the planet. Any further delay in concerted global action will miss a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. So it is with that fresh call to action in mind, um, we certainly can reflect reflect proudly about the climate and clean energy ambition contained in Governor Hochul's State of the State and Executive Budget proposals earlier this year. I'm, I'm not going to go through the elements of these proposals one by one, but will summarize with my firm belief that this package of proposals, both policies, programs, and investments represent the strongest slate of climate and energy action I have seen in my career here uh, at NYSERDA, certainly, and especially in some of the toughest emission reduction areas that we all are aware of, such as buildings and transportation. 
And it's great to see that these actions are in strong alignment with the draft scoping plan that we approved for issuance last year and that we all contributed to for public comment. Though that plan is still draft, close observers will note how well this platform conforms with many of the most impactful, no regrets, and yet urgently needed recommendations in the scoping plan. So I feel um, very optimistic as I look at this policy agenda and look forward to moving it forward together this year um, with each of you. Next slide, please. Zooming in on some recent activity in offshore wind, I also wanted to lead with an acknowledgement of the recent energy price issues. And hopefully all of you saw the release issued by Governor Hochul just two days ago, warning <laughs> New Yorkers about rising energy costs and directing utilities and fuel providers to work with consumers to provide energy and cost saving solutions. So I specifically want to thank Chair Christian of the Public Service Commission for his team's leadership in working with Con Edison and the other state utilities to address concerns about bill increases as much as possible. And of course, as I know each member of the council knows, there is only so much that we as a state and energy providers can do to address supply costs, which largely track the price fluctuations of global commodity markets. But that's part of the reason we've been working so hard for approaching a decade to bring new homegrown resources to bear at scale, such as offshore wind. And it has been a banner few weeks for offshore wind milestones, certainly, with the groundbreaking for New York's first offshore wind farm, the South Fork Wind, and a specific congratulations to you, uh, Chair uh, LIPA CEO Falcone, for hitting that milestone. And most recently, with the amazing, I would say, finalized results from Bohm's lease area auction for the New York Bite. And as you can see on the slide, we have six new unshaded lease areas, six new leaseholders, which are now entering the market, which is both a mix of new entrants and prior leaseholders that will together bring beneficial competition to the equally competitive next procurement that NYSERDA is preparing to issue soon. So we're excited to see what these project proposals will ultimately materialize and, and ultimately um, the accompanying supply chain and port infrastructure investment opportunities that they will yield, thanks notably to the governor's $500 million commitment in her executive budget. So with that, I will wrap things up with my thanks um, and pass the mic back to you, Sarah. Thanks, Doreen. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Thanks, um, and actually the next slide as well. Um, so I view this meeting largely as about establishing a work plan for the council for the year ahead um, and also setting clear expectations for everyone involved. And so just wanted to take a couple minutes to cover what we'd like to achieve at this meeting. Um, before I do that, though, I do want to just introduce a couple colleagues. Um, I think you'll recognize at least one of them. Um, Farah Anderson of CADMES, um, who is often um, helping out with the tech check when, we, when you first join, as well as Catherine Morris of the Consensus Building Institute, or CBI. They've been involved in the Climate Action Council process uh, to date, mostly on kind of the back end side, also helping out with the advisory panels and working groups. Um, and they have experience in other states um, and municipalities doing similar planning efforts. Uh, they'll be um, available to assist the council more directly this year. Um, and I expect their involvement will, will really help the council have a very successful year, um, successful and productive year as we move towards the final scoping plan. Um, so just wanted to um, introduce them to you just briefly. Um, we'll hear more from Catherine a little bit later in the meeting. Um, and both of them um, might chip in or jump in if I'm uh, missing anything as, as we go over these slides, because um, a lot of the, the thinking that has gone into this was, was also done alongside them. Um, so with that, um, I'll turn to the objectives here. Um, so we want to review and discuss the activities uh, that are ahead for the council and offer a proposed schedule for the council to consider. We also want to align on the, the key topics that the council needs to land in terms of a consensus position um, and understand what processes what could be helpful in supporting uh, the deliberations um, as well as the decision making process. 
Um, we'll also discuss the public hearing schedule and the public comment period. So really, just to sum it up, we're trying to get alignment on um, what you as the council want to cover for this year. And um, we're here to try to help uh, facilitate that. So we could go to the next slide, please. And actually one more. So starting with the activity plan overview here, I wanna start at a, a high level describing what's envisioned and then we'll get more detail as we go through this slide and, and others here today. So um, I would say that we had a very successful year in getting uh, the draft scoping plan out on the timeline prescribed in statute last year. Um, but I can't imagine I'd be the only one that would say that the end of the year was a bit more hectic than I would have asked for. Um, so in an attempt not to repeat that, we're offering uh, suggested rough phasing of the work before the council. So there might be some adjustments to the specific timeframes that we have here, um, or maybe even like a little bit of, of, of overlap or fading from one phase into the other. Um, but what we're, what we're thinking of as the first main phase of work is really the information gathering. Then we'd move uh, into more discussions and deliberations of the council before moving into the final phase of the year, which we're suggesting is the drafting and finalizing the scoping plan. So the, the information gathering phase, uh, it would include the public comment period and the, and the public hearings. We would also re-engage with the Climate Justice Working Group to advance our approach to operationalizing equity and climate justice. We'll also circle back on that in a little bit more detail um, later on in our agenda here today. Um, we'd also launch communications and public awareness and educational material and initiate any expert engagement that is needed. In the, in the following discussions and deliberations phase, we'd move into considering the input and feedback received in the prior phase. Um, and this would be as the council holds meetings to discuss and advance the topics where the council has not yet reached, reached consensus. Um, we would also fully roll out communications material and continue any expert engagement um, as is needed. Um, and the goal of this phase would be to get as close as possible to a consensus position before moving into the drafting phase where we would document the council's uh, decisions and finalize the plan. Um, it may seem like we've got a, you know, a good chunk of time in this last drafting and plan uh, finalization phase, but I really do believe that something along these lines is necessary, um, particularly if you think about um, we'll have a, you know, a pencils down date that um, would need to incorporate the required four to six weeks approximately for the final technical editing and layout of the final plan in advance of the January 1 deadline for release of the final scoping plan. Um, but before um, I open it up to discussion, I want to step through some of the activities in a bit more detail just to help uh, frame out what is uh, what's before us this year. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Starting first with the Climate Action Council meetings, we'd expect that, they'd, that uh, you'd meet at least on a monthly basis um, and that that would be necessary for the council, for the full council to discuss any open issues and make decisions um, as to the content of the final scoping plan. Um, expert topical input could be provided in a, in a variety of different forums. It could be presentations at council meetings or panel discussions like were held last year on reliability planning, you know, just to name a couple. And these could be at the request of the, of the council. Uh, we could also um, look to targeted stakeholder feedback to supplement the other um, more general input. We could seek that from particular industries or sectors. Uh, I heard at the last council meeting that there was an interest in the utility consultation group. You know, that was one idea that was put forward. We've, we've also been offered a presentation or panel discussion on a variety of other topics, including, um, for instance, district heating systems um, that might be of interest to the council. Um, another idea that we could uh, explore is formation of subgroups. Um, and those subgroups could be charged with answering particular questions or gathering information and developing particular recommendations that would be brought back to the full council to, to consider. If we could move to the next slide, please. Um, and as was 
uh, mentioned um, earlier too, I think it's, it's really important to highlight the climate justice working group feedback that the council received last year. Um, as you'll recall, the working group joined us at public meetings um, in June, July, September, and October, uh, providing feedback on the recommendations from the advisory panels and other working groups. Um, as, I've, as I've noted it, at previous meetings, the feedback that the council received from the climate justice working group um, was noted within the draft scoping plan. Um, in some in some cases, this requires, you know, a, I would say additional council discussion and decision making as to how they would like to address that feedback. Um, and that um, that could also be informed uh, by public input. Um, but to help ensure that uh, the climate justice working group feedback is appropriately considered by the council, I just wanted to let folks know that um, the state staff team is providing a con consolidated summary of where the climate justice working group feedback is contained within the draft scoping plan. Um, we can provide this to both the council and the climate justice working group um, so that they can um, they can see where their, their feedback was incorporated and, and how it was incorporated. And the council can also um, work to determine how to proceed with further incorporating that input into the scoping plan or modifying any of the, uh, the current existing strategies there. Uh, and the council could also identify uh, areas where they'd find further discussion and consultation with the climate justice working group beneficial and we could propose that back to the climate justice working group. Um, but of course, I would also say that the, you know, the, count, the climate justice working group um, as anyone is always welcome to provide additional feedback to the council um, that they feel is necessary and should be considered. Um, but regardless, I would say, uh, you know, their meaningful involvement will ensure that the Climate Act is informed by priorities of, of frontline communities. Next slide, please. Yes, Sarah, maybe I'll just add oh, sure. one, one element to that and just to underscore, I think you, you hit it right. Um, in terms of meaningful, but just to underscore it, I mean, this really is, uh, this is an important aspect of what we're doing. This isn't a check the box. I know we are, we all are very busy um, with our regular jobs in addition to this, but um, the, the working group has done an enormous amount of work. And um, it's important for us to seek their counsel in a meaningful way, in an ongoing way, counsel, C-O-U and S-E-L, counsel in a meaningful way, um, not to do more work for us, uh, as they have already done that work, but really in internalizing how we have listened to them and uh, and what the exchange is going to be moving forward. So, uh, as 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 Sarah mentioned, that sort of reciprocal dialogue and looking for opportunities to to have more robust collaboration. I think that's as important as any of the substantive work we do. So, I just want to make that point and underscore what you what you said. Thank you. Thanks, Basil. Um, so, moving on to the, the public input, uh, the council is required, um, as we've mentioned before, to hold six hearings geographically balanced across the state. However, given the large geography of the state, um, and as well as the importance of the scoping plan to the future of the state, we've planned for seven in-person hearings to provide good geographical representation. Um, and these locations, we've also considered proximity to population centers and accessibility to public transit. Um, and we'll be uh, planning to broadcast these hearings for public awareness. We'll also hold uh, two virtual hearings to complement the in-person hearings and give folks the opportunity to participate from the comfort of their own home. Um, as we've mentioned before, written comment will be accepted through the comment period and the council will need to consider the full set of public comments once the public comment period closes. Uh, to aid in that, staff uh, can provide summaries of the comments, and we would anticipate those being significant items um, at the agenda meeting, at the meetings of the council following the close of the public comment period. Um, of course, while we're planning all of this, uh, including the in-person hearings with an eye towards the COVID situation, there's always the possibility that we may need to adjust the hearings uh, to maintain safety. So if that does occur, the backup plan is to move the in-person hearings to virtual hearings at the same date and time as the originally planned in-person hearing. Um, and then um, just as a reminder for the council member involvement, we don't have specific requirements, but we'd encourage members to try to attend at least two public hearings. And ideally we're aiming for uh, four council members per hearing. Uh, to listen to the public comments as they come in. I'll also note that 
um, we have educational summary slide decks that are under development um, and will be made available shortly to help distill the draft scoping plan content into a more accessible level of detail. Um, and if we turn to the next slide, you'll see the calendar of dates and locations for the hearings. Um, so the, the organizing of, of these events has, has taken a bit more time to, to firm up given the evolving COVID situation. Um, and since we wanted to be sure to provide sufficient advance notice to the public, um, we're looking to start the, the hearings in April as opposed to starting them at the end of this month as we indicated um, was the plan um, back in December. Um, so as I mentioned, we selected the locations to provide good geographic coverage of the state, also considering uh, population and accessibility to public transit for the particular venues. Uh, we are currently contracting with the venues and we'd announce the, the specific locations in a notice of the hearings, um, which we would get out in the next week or so. Um, we're, uh, we're planning to start the hearings in the Bronx and Brookhaven the first week of April. Uh, the following week, we're proposing a virtual hearing followed by an in-person hearing in Albany. The week of April 18th which is Earth Week. Uh, since that's often a busy week for a number of folks, uh, uh, and also um, I think this coincides with school vacation week, um, that we decided to leave that week free from hearings. Um, then we'd pick back up um, the last week in, uh, in April with hearings in Syracuse and Buffalo before heading to Brooklyn the first week of May and then the central, central Adirondacks the following week. Um, we'd also wrap up um, the hearing schedule with a virtual hearing um, to make sure that anybody that was not able to attend the in-person hearings but still wanted to provide oral comment had the opportunity to do so. And um, with that, I'll hand it back to Doreen to just say a few words about the public comment period and schedule. Doreen? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, so, so certainly, as as I'm sure you've noted, and we have too, um, you you will note that currently the public comment period is scheduled to close at the end of April. <laughs> Yet, according to this schedule, we'd have hearings occurring outside of that comment period. So, so certainly, while not a steadfast rule, we we generally like to provide hearing hearings within the open comment period on an issue. And seeing that we heard um, general support for extending the comment period, what Basil and I would propose today is that we extend the comment period by 30 days um, to now conclude at the end of May. This would certainly both afford members of the public additional time to weigh in with their thoughts and still provide a reasonable amount of time for the council to consider those public comments as, as described as we discuss and deliberate issues toward development of the finalized scoping plan at the end of the year, according to the schedule that, that you just heard about. So, so that's sort of point number one. We, we would propose to extend the comment period through the end of May. And then secondly, as Sarah mentioned, it has certainly been challenging to land the logistics for these hearings. So, so I would say in a, as a general matter, um, we would ask that changes to the schedule um, really laid out here would be quite difficult to make. However, if there were a desire to make adjustments to any of the hearing dates, I would suggest that we focus on the virtual hearings as those would be the easiest to modify at this point, if you could see a reason we would want to. And then last, um, as you see here, we have certainly worked to cover as much of the state on a geographic basis as possible. Um, and in, you may note that we actually added this seventh in-person meeting to ensure we make these meetings um, again as, as to cover as much of our state's uh, geography as we can. Um, so I would say we would be challenged from a schedule and a budget perspective to add more than one additional hearing location. But if you think we've missed a particular geography, I would really want you to speak up and, and we would commit to doing our best to balance um, those considerations if, if you do think there was an area that we've missed and, and should add another meeting to accommodate. So I think at this moment um, and seeing that there's some hands raised, Sarah, I'm wondering if we should just stop and, and have some discussion around what the members have heard thus far. Is, is that okay with you? 
Yep, that works fine. Thanks. Okay, do you want to run through the numbers or do you want me to? Um, I can help here. So the first one I see is Bob Howarth. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, this all looks uh, great to me. It looks like a good good plan for the uh, uh, hearings and all. I originally put up my hand to ask about the extension of the public comment period because we have to do that. And I, I fully agree that uh, the extra 30 days is is needed. And I think that's that's the right level for cutting it off. My my only remaining question is a little bit orthogonal, but uh, as we move forward with climate action council meetings, will those be virtual or they will be in in person? For those of us who uh, live four to five hours from Albany or New York City, it's it's important to know fairly early on. Thank you. I'd say for now, um, well, right now we obviously this meeting is being held virtually, but I do anticipate that um, at some point this year we would be meeting. Um, once again, in person, as opposed to virtually, um, I, we've got, uh, authorization from, I think it's, uh, Peter, I want to, could correct me on this. I think it's chapter 1 of the laws of 2022 that allow us to hold the meetings virtually. Um, but depending on when the emergency declaration, um, is extended through, it's possible that we would lose that and we would have to be. Um, we would then have to go to meeting in person, um, but we'll try to let folks know in as much notice as 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 we have and as as we're able to give you too. Okay, thank you. That's great. Yeah, Bob, the current executive order, I think, expires within the next week or two, so we'll be at another decision point, but it could be extended. Donna, I saw your hand up. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. I too had my hand up to ask about extending the comment period. So um, that was answered. Thank you. I wondered if you thought about June 30th and, and I'm, I know there's pros and cons. So that that's 1 question only because I do still think that that many are, are just unaware of this. So just wondered about that. Um, my 2nd question would be, um, how will the CAC receive feedback from the comments that are made? Um, you know, during the public comment period, not the hearings, but during the, the comment period itself. And maybe you were going to get to that later, but I think you said they might be summarized. Are they going to be posted somewhere? How will we receive those? And then the third one, I wondered, um, how will these hearings be conducted? You know, is there some, I, I, who presides over them? I mean, I'm familiar certainly with public hearings in the, um, in, in the, in, in the realm of the public service commission, but I'm not sure how these are being conducted. Is it first come first served Do people? Stand in a line, how, how do you, you know, how, how would they, how would they work? All right, you've got a lot there. So please, uh, stop me before I move on if I don't hit all of those. But, um, mm -hmm. in terms of considering a June timeframe, um, uh, an end of June timeframe for the comments. Um, I'm not sure if Dorian or Basil wants to weigh in here, but I would say there's a lot of work before the council. Um, and. And while I do see value in extending um, the comment period, I think we have to balance that with the appropriate amount of time for the council to consider those comments. Um, I don't know, Doreen or Basil, if you have any more kind of a direct response to the actual the actual time frame here, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I agree with you, Donna, that that we need to talk to New Yorkers um, and New Yorkers all across the state, and. Uh, you know, the balance and meetings here that we've that we've proposed. As well as the extension of public comment periods, I think will get us. A, a, a long way toward that, but not all the way, of course. Um, so I think we, we, we're welcoming of ideas on, on how we can communicate out more effectively. Um, it is a Herculean task to do so uh, to reach all concerned New Yorkers. Um, but, you know, m moving adjusting uh, public comment periods. Could slow us down on the back end, and then ultimately put us put us and our staff in a bind on, you know, doing those summaries and getting that getting that work out to you in, in advance of uh, you know the slowdown season in August. So, um, I, I think we'll we'll take we'll take whatever input you have on this and consider it. Um, but if there are other ways in addition to what we've proposed here that can help us uh, perform that that really important communication, I think we're we're all. Uh, all open arms uh, to any of those ideas. Thank yeah, you. And just, and just rounding this out, Donna, I, I think the one thing that's on my mind is, you know, I think let's see also how May goes. Um, you know, <laughs> if 
if we're collectively feeling differently in in a couple of months, I'm not against revisiting that that date yeah. for sure. Um, but I, I think where we sit now, this is just the most rational approach that we can take up for the balance of reasons just described. Thank you. I understand the balance. Thank you. So, Donna, your your next question was about posting the comments. Um, so what we've planned for is to post all of the public comments after the close of the public comment period. Um, we, we will post them publicly. Um, however, there's, uh, you know, frankly, it's, it's a little bit of a resource issue trying to manage the, the kind of the real time posting of them. We do need to review the comments to make sure that there's no, um, you know, personal or sensitive information or any inappropriate language. Um, before we'd post those. So we are planning on posting them to the climate action website uh, following the close of the public comment period. However, uh, you know, you have raised this before too of, you know, as a council member, how can you review these more real time and not just rely on the summaries um, from staff? And that's uh, completely reasonable. And we're working on providing access to a SharePoint location where we're um, housing all of those comments. Um, so, um, I will um, be in touch with members shortly. I would I would say within the next week or two with um, information of how to access those. And then um, the final question I think you had was about the format of the hearings. And so what we were thinking for those is that we would start them by having a uh, a brief presentation on the overview of the scoping plan. That would probably be about a 20 or 30 minute, really just trying to make it clear about what the scoping plan is and isn't and what the process is. Um, and then we would turn to um, just open it up for what I think what most folks would think of as a traditional hearing along the lines of something the PSC would do um, where, where um, it would be first come first serve um, with, uh, with residents coming up and, you know, basically when they got to the hearing, they would sign up if they wanted to uh, make a comment and we'd have microphones around the room where we'd go to them, um, allow them to make a statement. Um, and really the mode of the council members in attendance would be listening mode to really respect to hear everything that was being said. If there were clarifying questions that uh, council members felt were, were necessary to fully understand uh, the comment, we could, um, you know, those could be asked, but really this is about providing the space for the public to comment. Um, and so we're thinking that each, each hearing would be approximately three hours. However, um, I think it depends on, on the number of folks that we, that we see showing up. And I know in the past, um, in other, uh, uh, involvements like this that we have extended, you know, we don't do a hard cutoff at the end of the hearing if there's a few more people um, to speak. So we will, um, uh, we'll be kind of addressing that on a, on a case by case basis. Um, but all of these details and uh, the information for, uh, to where to get the latest information on, on the hearings, should anything, um, be switched to virtual from an in-person hearing, we would uh, post that on the Climate Act website at climate.ny.gov. Donna, did I get all of your questions? You did. Thank you very much. Yep. Sorry to take so much time, and I, and I do appreciate it. Thank no you. No problem. The next hand I saw was Peter Iwanowitz. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I appreciate it. Um, sorry, my hand widget thing isn't working, but I'm glad the chat feature is the workaround. Thanks. Um, I wanted to just make a, a comment, and I agree with Donna that the comment period should be extended, but maybe an alternative would be to have it 30 days after the last hearing. Um, that's typically what is done under administrative procedures. So maybe not as late as June 30th, but to give people time, especially those that also are are heavily invested in the legislative session that ends June 2nd, bumping it 30 days after that last day would, would give people time and space after the legislative session was over and important issues were adjudicated, hopefully then. So that would be my proposal is 30 days after the last either virtual and in-person hearing. Um, one other thing I would love to consider is moving one of the virtual hearings to be on a weekend. I know that's not typically something we do in government world, but the Climate Action Council is a little bit different and give an opportunity for people to attend a virtual hearing on the weekend might be worth our time and energy to encompass everything. 
and I, I think only sort of geographically um, to think about maybe a, a hearing location in Queens or Nassau County. I know we have a lot of them downstate, but you know it's a heavy population base and there's significant issues that it might be worth thinking of an additional one in the city or having two on Long Island that would cover um, you know, the nearby borough of Queens. And then I just was curious as to the details of you know, the virtual hearing for the in-person, um, you know, virtual hearings, uh, registration required in advance, and will we be communicating to folks technical support? Um, how far in advance will we be sort of letting people know um, roughly what time block they might be, you know, participating in? It's a little bit easier, obviously, to do with virtual than in-person, but I'm just curious as to those types of details, if you've kind of thought them through, um, and how we make these highly accessible and inclusive for all New Yorkers. Sure. Um, so I'm not going to respond to the virtual moving on a, a, to a weekend. I think that's something that is probably for, for other council members and, and the co-chairs to jump in um, on, as well as the additional hearing. I think we want to hear from other folks. But to your specific question about um, the format of the virtual hearings, I think we were planning a similar thing where we would have uh, kind of a, an information session followed by uh, open comment. We would likely have uh, pre-registration um, so that folks could sign up for those in advance so that we would be able to give a little bit of an indication as to um, the timing of, of comments, of, of what, kind of when they would be up for comments. Um, however, I don't know if, um, if I could maybe ask uh, someone from the CADMIS team to potentially jump in here. CADMIS will be also assisting with the virtual hearings. And so they've got, um, they've had a number of, they've helped us with a number of these in the past. And I would say um, they might have some additional ideas of how to um, make it as, as smooth and accessible um, as possible. So I would just, I would just open it up if anybody from the CADMIS team wants to jump in. Um, with ideas on the, the virtual hearing of how to make it the most accessible as possible that they, they could do so now. Uh, sure, thanks, Sarah. This is Farah. Um, I think just a couple of quick thoughts. One is um, agree the pre-registration does does help um, and, and sending information to people about you know how long they're going to speak for, roughly when, that type of thing. So they know, okay, I'm signing up for a two minute slot. Um, and, you know, kind of get back to them, okay, you know, you were one of the first registrants, you'll probably go in the first half hour, that type of information. Um, and then secondly, I, I know that for, for these meetings, we um, often have uh, sort of live translation through like PowerPoint. So I think the state can consider if there's, um, you know, something similar that it wants to do so that, um, you know, uh, at least some form of people being able to listen in with, uh, you know, essentially subtitles in a variety of languages as possible. Um, so, so things like that, I think, can also be helpful. And then there's obviously the things that are outside of the event itself um, around outreach, um, ensuring that outreach is really done in an accessible um, and inclusive manner, including, again, different languages being posted in different places where where it makes sense doing outreach with, you know, other partner organizations that, you um, reach a, a, you know, the whole broad swath of, um, of the state, I think, are a few concepts to consider for the council. Great. So I have a couple quick, just real quick direct responses to Cadmus on this, these points. I was hoping, one, I, I think we should, you know, share in advance what the time limit is for speakers. I don't know if we were thinking 20 minutes, 25, um, or was it just three? Thanks, Sarah, for smiling. Um, <laughs> I think that's important now it's just for us to sort of say this is what the you know we'll give three five minutes whatever it's going to be and on the virtual hearings too we should allow people to register up until the day in advance i i know there's always that you know trying to do it earlier than that but we should really go up to the day in advance and if possible epa had a recent hearing that i participated in the day before they kind of posted the schedule with like time blocks and i found that really helpful that i you know i didn't have to sign on at noon i could you know log in in the time block and from five to whatever, if we could do that too, to give people a little bit of a better sense for the virtual hearings, exactly when they should be turning to their computer. Assuming we give people time limits with the clock and um, you, can, you can manage that, so. Uh, great suggestion, Peter, if you actually have a link to the, to any information on, on how that meeting or was posted or something, um, I'd be happy to take a look at that and see what we could replicate there. 
Right. And assuming we'll kind of follow the executive order of the 10 most commonly spoken languages in New York for translation services on virtual. Yes, with PowerPoint Live, I believe that makes it so that it, I, I think we actually might be able to do more than the, those 10 languages. Um, and for the in-person hearings, um, great point that you, you brought up about the different languages. We will be putting in the notice that if folks um, would like to have translation services available, we will do our best to, to make that happen. We just need to know in advance. So we will also be having that in the notice as well. Thank you. Yeah, and um, if I could just jump in on, you had a question about moving a virtual hearing to the weekend. Certainly in placing these meetings in the late afternoon and evening, we were trying to get at the same thing, Peter, which is, you know, trying to trying to get at a time of day when you might be able to catch people um, either coming or going um, from work, perhaps. The weekend, um, I'm wanting to just wait a bit. I know there's a number of other hands raised um, on that topic, coupled with your proposal to consider another location in the New York City or Long Island area just because I have a feeling others might have, have a different point of view. I'm just interested to hear what they are. I, I, we do have, as I had indicated, some budgetary and timing constraints here. So if we could just sort of log that for the good of the order and see where others land, that would be helpful to me. As well as the extension of the comment period? Or is that yeah, it? yeah, the extension of the comment period. Um, yeah, I'm interested to hear what others have to say on that one. Um, Obviously, we landed where we did for the balance of issues that we described, but I think those three um, are issues that others will probably have been put on as well. So maybe let's just continue and hopefully, Sarah, you or someone else is keeping or maybe Farah is, <laughs> is keeping sort of notes as to um, where everyone's landing. So if it's okay with you, Peter, let's just hear from others too. And Doreen, maybe I'll just, just quickly weigh in on the, <clears throat> on the weekend point. I mean, I, I'm happy meeting 24-7. I don't really care. Um, whenever we're adding things on weekends, I always worry about staff who yep. have been frankly nonstop on this since November or earlier. Um, so just as a variable to consider if there are other ways to, to, to reach Peter, that important point that you're making about, um, equity and ability for folks to dial in and be part of this. Um, just want that to be out there and folks to mm -hmm. consider, consider that. Thanks. Yeah, it's also a good point, Basil, in that we are all, you know, an, a large number of us will be hitting these events 4 to 7 p.m. for a month, right? So it's a, it's a big, a big lift for all of, all of our staff um, over a period of five, six weeks. So I think we just have to sort of think about this um, in a balanced manner. So um, I see hands up for Raya, Ron, Dennis. I did see Gavin's, but I think that might be down now. And then Donna. So in that order, Raya. Hi, thank you very much. So certainly I am um, supportive of extension of the comment period, you know, as far as practical, um, all best practices that, you know, have to do with meaningful engagement, be it, pers uh, be it in person, be it virtual, you know, um, I think we've come a long way since the pandemic and there's a lot that we can make sure that we, we incorporate. And, and so thanks everyone there. Um, I do think that we've missed an extremely important area in terms of hearing location. And that is, um, the mid Hudson, um, and Southern Westchester in particular, um, it, in particular, because as we know that Southern Westchester has the highest percentage of disadvantaged communities outside of New York City in the entire state. Um, it's not easy to get from, you know, from the, the Westchester region to Long Island to go to a meeting in the city. Um, so I certainly request that we have a meeting in that area, say a White Plains, um, potentially Yonkers, um, a place like that. Uh, so thank you very much. And I could accommodate a weekend as well. I know it's very challenging, but as part of a you know a public engagement strategy, we have to be able to meet people where they are and at the times where they are, or else we won't have a meaningful engagement. So that's my comment there. Thanks, Raya. Ron? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. 
Sorry, <laughs> I went on mute just as Carol you were going are, off mute. <laughs> yeah, Carolyn and I are tag teaming here. Um, so I actually too was going to raise the issue about Mid Hudson, but more kind of looking at the corridor. So I ninety is well covered. Ivy seven is covered, but the whole ID four, eighty six, eighty eight corridor has nothing. So if it's virtual, I'd be fine with that. But something targeted towards the southern tier and the mid Hudson region, um, because when you look at the map, that is glaring. Uh, I'm not suggesting this has to be in person, but I think you know there's a lot of manufacturing along that corridor that will be impacted by the uh, scoping plan, and we should be basically ensuring we're gathering that feedback. The other comment I was going to make is in terms of the uh, virtual meetings. Uh, I understand the reasoning for having the five to seven meetings or four to seven meetings in terms of in person, but I would recommend one of the virtual meetings be in the morning. Uh, I'm concerned that um, you know we will be missing critical elements, including of uh, disadvantaged communities that may work overnight shifts and won't be available from a four to seven or whatever the time frame is. So those are my two comments. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Dennis. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit about the, the subtopics. Uh, so I, I kind of like missed, uh, and you had mentioned that one of the ones, uh, as an example, is district heating. Is that a is that a conversation we're going to have during later on this meeting, or or are, should I be providing input to the type of topics now? So I think the topics we want to hold um, for just a little bit later in this conversation. Okay, yep. okay. No, I'm good with that because I, 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 some of it is I think some of those subtopics I'd like to see earlier uh, because it should be part of you know what public feedback is all about. And so I, I would just do that. And the other thing is, uh, and I know Doreen mentioned the six gigawatt uh, goal that came out of the the governor's uh, state of the state. Uh, and and I I'd note that I I'm not seeing that 10 gigawatt solar uh, increase or the six gigawatt prominently displayed on the the Climate Act uh, web. And I I just think that if that's our new goal, let's make sure that we're putting it out there that way because I think it attracts a lot of attention. Um, unless I've missed it, and of which I'm reading far too much stuff lately. So so thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, Donna, your hand is up. Is that a new Thank hand? You. Yeah, just 1 other quick thought and it was on locations of meetings as others have suggested other locations and I, I aligned with Ron um, separately, which was I wondered about the southern tier. As we think about areas that maybe um, we should be trying to hear from um, that, that, that look like they may not be. Um, we might not be hitting so thank you for thinking about that 1 too. Thanks, Donna. Uh, Rory. So I, I want to echo what Donna and Ron have said about the Southern tier and also uh, what Raya mentioned about Westchester. I, I think having meetings in those areas would be helpful and they are obvious areas where I think it, that there's a need. Um, however, I'm also recognizing that staff is limited and uh, this would add potentially a significantly higher burden. Uh, one alternative I want to suggest um, with the in-person meetings is it is it possible to make that a hybrid meeting type where you can attend in person, but you may observe from a distance? Um, I only suggest this in part uh, that may allow for greater participation, give more people opportunities to at least hear early on what's happening if they can't speak at a particular event, say the one in the Bronx or Brookhaven, they might be able to watch and then make the decision to speak at a subsequent event. So wanted to suggest that as an option for potentially enhancing and increasing participation by turning these in-person meetings into hybrid in-person virtual meetings as well. Thanks, Rory. That's um, sorry if I, if that was an important point that I meant to mention earlier. So if I didn't, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, we are intending for the in-person hearings to be broadcast. So they'll be webcast in some form so that folks can um, watch them and hear them from home. 
Um, but I will say, just to be clear, we're trying to stay away from the hybrid version where folks at home can also be commenting at the in-person hearing, just because when we've tried to do that in some other meetings with audio in multiple places, we, we sometimes have some technical issues. So what we're trying to do is it'll be, it'll still be just the in-person um, attendees able to provide um, public comment, but um, they will be uh, webcast so that folks can, can listen to that, as you mentioned. Gotcha. Thanks for that, sir. Yep. I am not seeing any additional hands unless Raya's and Ron's are new hands. Back to legacy hand. I forgot. <laughs> <It's been Sorry. laughs> um, and, and oh. I'm not sure. Oh, sorry. Please, Sarah, go on. I was going to try to summarize what we heard. <laughs> Or yes, to. I was gonna. I was gonna go there too. So go for it, uh, Sarah. <laughs> I'll I'll give it a shot. But please, uh, please jump in. So I heard Peter suggest. Um, it, well, maybe we want to take these um, kind of one item at a time. So in terms of the comment period, I heard Peter say that he was suggesting one month after the last uh, hearing. Um, I didn't. According to my notes, I think here any other um, any other recommendation in terms of, of of extending that. But so that I guess that would be on the table. Do we want to extend um, through the uh, through the end of June or even you know thirty days after the last public comment? Uh, Doreen, do you want to take these one at a time, or should I just summarize the other points? I think too? yeah. Why don't you just summarize them all? I, I think in the end we're we're going to take in. I have to sort of come back on this, but why don't you summarize okay. all of them, Sarah? Thank you. In terms of additional locations, I heard a suggestion for the Southern Tier by Ron that Donna um, seconded that. I also heard Raya mention Yonkers. Um, shoot, and someone, uh, Peter also mentioned another one potentially um, in New York City or on Long Island. Oh, I just said also potentially white plains are also capturing the central Hudson region. Okay. Thank you, Raya. White plains would probably be better than Yonkers. Okay. And then uh, the virtual hearing about moving that, I heard um, one that we should move uh, the virtual, move at least one of the virtual hearings to a weekend. And I heard another suggesting that we move the virtual hearing to a morning time. Thanks, Sarah. Green, is that consistent with what there you have? Only, there was only one virtual meeting. Okay. Got Thanks, Ron. Okay, so in those three categories, um, that's the same thing that I had heard. Um, that again, the three points are the the extension consideration of an ex further extension to the comment period. The second is um, the timing of the virtual hearings, and the third is if we were to add one more here in person hearing, whether we would do so in one of those three geographies that you just laid out, Sarah. Um, so I think for the, the purposes of today, this is exactly what we wanted to, to hear. And, and I think as to your point, Sarah, the plan is to um, notice these meetings formally in the next week or two and um, with, their, with their actual locations within these communities. So I think when, I think that will be our next step is to essentially see what we can do to accommodate these considerations um, for those three topics as described. Um, this is Rose. Uh, I just have one quick question for our attendance. You want us in person. Is, is that correct at 2? Or is virtual okay? So virtual is certainly okay if you're not able to make it in person. I think we would like to have um, some in person representation and I will be coordinating. Um, I'll be reaching out to council members to try to, you know, understand what their desire is for which meetings they'd like to attend. And I think based on that, we can also, you know, if we have a, a strong in person presence, I think that 
um, you know, other members would be welcome to join virtually, but maybe don't necessarily need to um, um, emit the carbon traveling to uh, those locations. Yeah, right. Rose, I, I guess it's, it is not an expectation. I, I just want to be clear. It's just a, you know, a suggestion and, and, and the suggestion of two is, I think a reasonable balance um, that you could think about, but, but certainly your point is well taken. You can certainly hear the feedback um, remotely as, as we've laid these out. But um, I know that many of us um, are, this is central to our work. So I, I appreciate your commitment to, to hearing from the public on these important issues. No, yeah, it was just a matter of, you know, how it would look if we're always virtual. Um, but and will in the meetings, will it be clear who is attending from the uh, committee that is is attending virtual, or will will they know that other council members are attending if you attend it if you attend virtual? Yeah, thanks, Rose. I I must say I'm not exactly sure how the yeah, live okay. casting works, but what I would you would have is my direct commitment to certainly announce um, any members that were listening um, or uh, um, witnessing the hearing virtually. Um, so gotcha. that in that uh, way, we would make sure that that was known. Doreen, did you want to um address any of the other issues about the virtual hearings um, about moving those or not? Yeah, so the thing that I, I need to do a little research on, and in fact, I'm, I'm interested to hear from Adriana and, and others about this is really, I, I actually am not sure how to get, we, we all share the objective of broad participation. Um, I just, I don't have the particular expertise to know if morning or night or weekends or weekdays, like what what is actually better? So my personal goal is to just educate myself a bit and and frankly, accommodate whatever will result in that desired outcome um, most effectively. So I think I my opinion is I, I've I've really appreciated the feedback, but on those three topics, what I think we should do, Sarah, is just reconvene, you know, as, as state representatives and, and sort of see as much of this as we can accomplish and then certainly share that with the members um, at the, in the next week or two as we prepare to issue the notice. Understood. Thank you. Okay, so with that, we've got um, just a couple additional slides left in this section. Um, so if you could go to the next page, please. So um, I wanted to just touch on the integration analysis um, to set appropriate expectations here. So um, of course, we know that the integration analysis scenarios have been developed uh, or incorporated into the draft scoping plan um, and that these can continue to serve as a foundational knowledge base to inform the, the final scoping plan. However, we are gonna have um, a, a narrow window of time after the public comment period ends but before the uh, final scoping plan drafting, where there's the potential to build on the integration analysis scenarios and implement uh, high priority focus sensitivity analysis that could be responsive to uh, whether it's feedback from the public, uh, the council itself, the climate justice working group. Um, so in order to complete those focus sens sensitivities in time to inform the council deliberations, uh, priorities for the dedicated additional research would need to be finalized uh, well within the second quarter of this year. And we've listed here uh, some of the potential areas of inquiry based on feedback that we received uh, last quarter, uh, which will include continued assessment of the impacts of different heating system configuration, uh, the factors that affect the impacts of ground source um, and district loop heat, heat pumps, uh, the impact of expanded uncertainty range in electric distribution system investments associated with electrification, 
and further alignment of the integration analysis benefit cost framework with the greenhouse gas accounting um, that was incorporated in the recently published DEC statewide uh, greenhouse gas emissions report. Uh, going to the next slide. Um, so all of these activities that we've covered so far today are intended to lead us to the main deliverable of the council for the year, which is a finalized scoping plan by January 1st, 2023. Uh, so the council is going to need um, time to discuss the various inputs it receives over the next few months. And then based on those discussions, the draft scoping plan uh, will be revised. Uh, council approved revisions will be incorporated into the into the scoping plan. And ideally we'd have um, all of these identified uh, and incorporated by sometime in October. Um, and we could more specifically identify that um, that particular deadline as we um, for, for the final changes as we get closer to that time and understand um, the progress that we're making. We're also going to look to improve upon the process that we used last year for review of the draft. Um, and so, for instance, now that we have a draft um, in full form that we can work from, it'll be a little easier to provide draft revisions um, to specific sections and get those around for review rather than uh, providing a, uh, a fully revised draft um, for you to, uh, to review and provide feedback on. Um, so that would set us up for successfully meeting the required release of the final scoping plan by January 1, 2023. Um, and so at this point, I uh, just did want to stop and see if there are any additional clarifying questions on the material that we covered. Um, and then kind of revisiting the, the phases that I started with, you know, do these seem like the right phases and can we commit to um, to working to have, uh, you know, maybe the timelines aren't sp as specific as they were on that one slide, but, you know, generally that we can commit to having those phases to have a little bit of an, um, a more orderly uh, review process. And so with that, let's see if anybody has hands up. Um, I see that Rose has her hand up. Rose? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, sorry. It's a, it's old. Oh. <laughs> All that to tell you that. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bob Howarth. Thanks, Susan. Uh, first, I'm really pleased to see that you've included the uh, further analysis, technical analysis of some of the details of heating and the the district heating and the ground source versus air source stuff is, uh, you know, this uh, we discussed some in the fall. I think that's really important to look into and, and really uh, need some critical analysis and discussion. So I'm delighted by that. The only thing I I really don't see though in, in your plan is is discussion of uh, uh, economics beyond the cost benefit analysis. You know, uh, issues of uh, how we pay for things, issues of uh, carbon fees, et cetera, seem to be absent from the from the discussion. So I'm wondering if it, uh, well, it seems to me that needs to be part of our, our discussion. Let me say that. Yep, um, very good point. The next uh, phase is getting into the topics and that is uh, one of the topics that okay. um, that we've teed up. So uh, okay, certainly sure. can take your input there too. Okay, well, well thank you for highlighting the, the heating aspect. Yep. Uh, Carolyn? Yeah, just a schedule uh, question from a logistical perspective. If, uh, like last year, I think um, Commissioner Sagos mentioned that August was a challenging time to schedule meetings, and we take that out of the equation for a council meeting, um, that, that leaves uh, July and September and maybe October um, for the council to deliberate on uh, public comments and, and just wanting to flag that is that are three meetings enough time to um, really kind of understand all of the public comments um, and will, you know, whether they will be digested in the time frame between June, June and July to even count July as a meeting um, to just really have a substantive conversation on incorporating com public comments. 
Thanks, Carolyn. Um, I would say that while I did mention approximately monthly meetings, I don't think we'd be limiting uh, to monthly meetings. Um, and so in some cases I do see, like as you're saying, that it may be that we need to, the council needs to meet more frequently than once a month in order to uh, manage the work that it has at that given time. Um, we do have over, um, I would say, 11 or 1200 comments in already, and we typically see most of the comments come in at the, towards the end of the comment period. So I would expect that we'll have quite a significant number of, of comments to review. So very good point. We're gonna be doing our, um, our best uh, to, um, to summarize those as quickly as possible um, as, as they come in and to, work with, um, honestly, the staff teams of, of all the agencies about how we could potentially incorporate some of those in and, and to bring that back to the council for, um, you know, as a suggestion as well. So, um, yes, it will, it will be likely a busy summer, even if we uh, were to avoid having a council meeting in August. Um, I saw Gavin had his hand up as well, Gavin. Yeah, um, just building upon, uh, I agree with Bob's comments about costs and how we're going to deal with this. And I think we're going to deal with that later, but, you know, we're an hour and 20 minutes into this meeting and the, the word reliability has never come up here. And I think, you know, when you talked at the beginning about expert engagement, uh, I'm hoping that that's where we're going to have the discussion about reliability because without reliability, we have nothing here. And, and I just have not heard that word mentioned in this overall scheme and of slides that have been laid out. And I, I think it's really important that that be the number one issue we be focused on. Thank you. Thanks, Gavin. Um, and Dennis. Yeah, I, um, I'm glad that Gavin mentioned that. I was going to mention resiliency, but I'm assuming that these additional topics are later on, as Sarah pointed out. We we did throw out uh, distribution on the, the previous slide and you know, I just want to make it clear distribution is kind of like bigger than decarbonization. Uh, it's about uh, smart growth. It's about economic development activity. It's about community revitalization. Uh, it's bigger than just, you know, this very simplistic view of upgrading our distribution network. It's going to be probably the single most uh, challenging element to be able to achieve the demand side of the climate goals. And, I, and I, I, I say all of these different elements because it's not just climate change that we should be referring to relative to distribution, but also infrastructure. Uh, so these two elements can come together. So I, I, I just wanna clarify, I just think we gotta have a bigger and more holistic view on distribution. Um, it, is, it is not where we need it to be in order to achieve these type of goals. Thanks. All right, thank you, Dennis. So it sounds like there's a lot of interest in moving to the next topic area too. Let me just see if we've got any other additional hands here. Sarah, I know, um, uh, I think it was Bob who had asked if, if we're gonna try to organize the members around these public hearings and, and yes, we are. We'll, yes. <laughs> we'll find a way to, to see who's coming to what meeting and, uh, and organize as such. Yep. Hear, hearing that is, sorry, hearing. Hearing, yes, thank you. Okay, so if we could go to the next slide then. Um, and actually, I think you can go ahead one more. Um, so now we're gonna move into the, the topics and, oh, not one more yet. Um, go back one, please, <laughs> thanks. Um, so we're gonna move into the topics and process for supporting the council deliberations. Um, and so I would just like to point out while we're talking about what the topics uh, should be. I'd like to avoid debating positions on the topics themselves. Rather, you know, keeping in mind that we're trying to develop a work plan for the council for this year. Um, and with that little intro, I'm going to hand it over to Adriana to cover the next slide. Adriana? Thank you so much, Sarah. And I uh, just wanted to, at the start, just say I'm really honored to be here um, with the Climate Action Council and to be on uh, Team DEC. Uh, before we advance to the discussion portion, I wanted to take a moment to uh, underscore the importance of equity and climate justice as a key pillar of our work, uh, as it's required by the Climate Act. 
Uh, this has been, uh, it's been critical to the council's work to date, and I know that it will continue to be. Um, equity and climate justice is an overarching lens to be applied consistently to all topic areas. Um, and as mentioned previously in the meeting, uh, the work of the Climate Action Council this year will include advancing the integration of equity throughout the scoping plan and ensuring that it's central to the council's decision-making processes. And so as the council approaches the topics that have been set aside for further deliberation, uh, a couple of questions to consider. Um, how will equity and justice be considered and weighted in Climate Action Council decision-making processes? And what role should the climate, climate Justice Working Group have in shaping that approach as partners in this work? Of course, uh, further dialogues needed uh, with the working group itself on that point, uh, but uh, their meaningful involvement combined with a robust public input process that we were just discussing will help ensure that the Climate, climate Act is informed by priorities of disadvantaged communities. Um, as the concerns, uh, concerns from the Climate Justice Working Group are representative of concerns expressed by, by frontline communities. And so these concerns must be considered when we're deliberating um, our, our actions and positions. Uh, the, as, um, as you all know, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act uh, recognizes that low-income Indigenous nations and communities of color are shouldering uh, the disproportionate burden of environmental pollution and associated health impacts um, and vulnerability to the impacts of climate change, which will be fairly, further illustrated uh, in our disadvantaged communities criteria. And uh, to help the, uh, the council operationalize climate justice, um, I did want to uh, remind the, the council here that the Climate Justice Working Group has previously shared a lot of uh, really poignant and helpful comments and resources about integrating equity into the council's work. Um, and mentioned that we can consider reviewing these resources and others during future discussions to ensure that uh, our shared commitment to equity and justice is clear in the final scoping plan and that actions uh, and, and decisions made uh, do not exacerbate harm or vulnerabilities in, in disadvantaged uh, communities. So just wanted to do a little bit of that level setting there and now happy to turn it back over to Sarah. Thanks. Thanks, Adriana. <clears throat> so then on to the, the next slide here. So based on the discussion that occurred on the draft scoping plan back in, in December, we've pulled out a few topics where it seems that there's still significant uh, space between the council members in terms of their positions and um, thinking that additional deliberation is needed to land these topics. I will say there, there may be additional topics um, where there might not be as great of a distance between members, but what we're trying to capture here are are the real big significant items where we need to develop process around in order to, um, to finalize and land these items. So the first is the approach to the gas system transition. Uh, this seemed to be a topic of, of great interest to many of the council members, and it sounds like uh, we need to determine what New York's approach to decarbonizing the gas system should look like. Um, I believe that even if we can't reach 100% agreement on this, um, that there's still plenty of room for additional progress here. The next item um, being put forth are uh, the potential applications of advanced fuels. Um, this would include potential regulatory mechanisms, limits or conditions for their use, uh, the role of research, development and demonstration in these areas. And then finally, we see room for further progress on carbon pricing policies, uh, potential regulatory mechanisms around uh, funding mechanisms, the role of, of private funds and private financing, um, and how to align markets to help uh, facilitate the, the needed resources. And so um, with that, I'm going to um, hand it over to Catherine Morris, who um, again is from Consensus Building Institute. She's gonna help facilitate our conversation on these topics um, and as well as uh, what processes um, could help the decision-making process. And so with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Catherine. Thanks, Sarah. Um... So just by way of very short introduction, um, I wanted to assure you that um, I have been actually working um, on these topics with uh, the Climate Action Scoping Plan uh, in the background over the last year by working with some of the advisory panels, land use, ag, 
and also the uh, power gen. So I'm not coming to this conversation completely cold. And um, I have been in conversation also with Sarah and the Cadmus team about so the, how to develop really a strong work plan to make sure that you have the time you need to really dig into the topics that are um, you need to resolve. These three being the ones that we've pulled out as as the as Sarah said, the ones that maybe require the most time and, and concentration of the council's time. So, in order to try to help build that um, build that plan, that work plan that we would like to bring back to you next meeting, uh, we thought we'd walk through a sort of an exercise with you, where we. Um, talk about again, the sort of the options you have to support your decision making. What are some of the ways we can support you as well as the process for doing that? If we go to the next slide, Sarah touched on these earlier. Um, and you're familiar with many of them because you've been using them all along. Certainly the way to get inf additional information you've, you've mentioned that already that you would like to hear some and get some additional input from possible experts. Um, there's also the option for you to continue to reach out to targeted stakeholder groups and um, as well as consultations with the climate justice working group uh, throughout the process. Um, there may be some topics where you do, in fact, need some very targeted research. I mean, integration analysis is one option where there be if you prioritize some specific things that they can run through sensitivities that's uh, available to you. There may be some staff that could do some research to answer some of your questions. Um, so that there are multiple different ways that you can get the information you need so that you're all coming to the table with the same foundation and the information to make your decisions. I think the, the other thing you may need is just more time as a council together to discuss and share what concerns you have that are outstanding to generate some options for wh where, how you might resolve those concerns and, you know, again, continue to build consensus toward specific recommendations. So that is always a possibility. Um, but I wanted to, to talk a little bit more about the option here at the bottom of the screen, which is subgroups. This is not something that you've used before, but we wanted to put it out there as, an, as a possibility and, and get your feedback. So. The idea here is that there would be a subset of council members that would form a small group to meet in between meetings and uh, would really just take more time that would be needed to um, dig into a particular topic and bring back specific recommendations to the council for their consideration. These subgroups would would be strictly advisory. They would not have any decisional authority, but they would help the council uh, sort of do their due diligence in in gathering the information that's needed um, and thinking through those pros and cons of different options um, and allow this subgroup to do some of that on your behalf and then bring forward for further deliberation by the council. Um, if we move to the next slide, we can, uh, okay, let's go back. So one, of, let me just say a little bit more. We, I guess we don't, I don't have a slide to talk about this, but I want to say a little bit more about what that might actually look like. I think first you have to think about um, having this subgroup be representative of all the council interests. Um, that said, you don't want it to get too big. So if you could keep it under the size of say half of the council, that would give it the nimbleness to really um, flex and flexibility to, to, to meet more frequently. That would give you um, the option for them to really dig into via these conversations into the real substance of, a, of an issue. And it also gives you a much higher chance of actually getting the group to consensus if it's not too large in a very constrained time frame. So that would be ideal. Um, the group would be uh, given a specific charge by the council where they would be asked to answer a specific question or develop recommendations around a specific issue. So the council drives the scope of work of the subgroups. 
and um, then they, you know, the group goes about the business of doing the same type of deliberations, really parallel deliberations with the council. Uh, they would gather the information they need. They would uh, develop options together, evaluate those options, and try to reach consensus on recommendations that they think are the best um, the best solution to the, the problem or the issue. That said, they may not be able to reach consensus. And so there's obviously the, the op, the op, opportunity for them to come forward to the council with two or three options for your consideration. Um, I'm, I'm sort of presenting this uh, it, based on sort of my experience working with these types of, of task groups um, in larger collaborative processes. And my experience has been that they often, they work very well when you really need a lot of extra time, but they, you know, they obviously require the trust of the full council in delegating that responsibility. And they certainly don't take away, as I said earlier, any decision-making authority of the council. The other thing I think you have to think about is how you would uh, set up these, these different subgroups. A lot of different options. You could have volunteers, you could have nominations, you could create a subcommittee that, that appoints the um, subgroups, or you, you could uh, empower the co-chairs to actually make those appointments. Uh, whatever, whatever way you decide is appropriate, excuse me, uh, you would want to make sure that you have a mechanism for right sizing and balancing that group. So as it is, as I said, small enough, nimble enough, and is representative of the overall council. So those are things you'd have to think about as you, as you, if you were to decide that you wanted to use that type of approach for any of these topics. So let me stop there and just uh, before we get into the topic, so hold your questions or your comments about the topics themselves and see, I'd particularly like to hear if you have any reactions or concerns about setting up a subgroup, because the next step in this exercise is I want to ask you specifically what questions you have under each of these topics and how what is the best approach to answering them is it getting more information is it having more deliberations at the full council might it be setting up one of these subgroups so any any responses i see a couple hands already up uh rose and ann um i i think the uh i think the subgroup is a is a uh, is a good idea um, because uh, we don't have time um, really to go back and forth and so forth and so on and I think the ba obviously you, you balance them and how we do that I I don't I don't know if it's the co chairs or or whatever but there really hasn't been much time for the council itself to just deliberate and go back and forth. And it's great to focus in on certain areas of concern and then have recommendations back to the council. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, Anne and then Donna. I guess I would say about the same as what Rose said, you know, I think it's good that we've gotten do down to a small list of thorny topics, but they are thorny. And so if we had to do them sequentially, I don't think we would get done in a year. So if you have the subgroups, they can be arguing about these things on parallel tracks. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would suggest going with volunteers and then right sizing them if the group's too big or unbalanced by the co-chairs, but starting with volunteers because it might just work out fine. Great, Donna. Thank you. Um, I, I was gonna simply add that, that I found when we did, these weren't the same process, of course, but when we had small group discussions earlier on, I think it was last year, I found them to be very constructive. We did have a chance to each kind of state our position, hear each other, um, and, and discuss it. Um, I do wonder, how do we get the input from experts involved? Experts beyond the expertise 
that that we as council members have, and I know this is an issue that we've raised before. So how do we really get more expertise? So it's not just maybe some some of us having a viewpoint and that's that's contrary to others. But I I also um, like the concept, and I like the volunteerism concept. Thank you. Great. Um, just to, on your point of experts, I I think there is. Um, there are some contractors already on um, under some experts already under contract that could be brought in other other experts. Um, based in New York that you could bring in and certainly based on the types of questions you need answered, there's staff members that could have some expertise there, but each of those. Expert needs, I think, has to be vetted with the group to find out who you guys all feel are credible experts um, so that. You know, you don't feel like there's, you know, an expert is bringing in any kind of bias. So with that, I'll ask Raya and um, Commissioner Ball. Hi, just um, it, just quickly, I, I think this is an interesting idea about the subgroups. We do need vehicles for deliberation. I co-sign on Anne's comments about um, volunteering when, when we can. I also just wanted to ask, this is not in lieu of, um, I also agree with Donna that the the feedback sessions that we had directly with, um, you know, with the authors and the study teams on the draft itself and the dra were very productive and helpful. So just asking or just affirming that in addition to this deliberative process, that the, the, the process for iteration on language um, will, will also be robust and that we'll get plenty of time, uh, you know, in advance for that as well. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, but yes, I think that that's absolutely right that there will be, um, there is an intention, regardless of whether you have subgroups for there to be adequate time for the, the council to um, have that those conversations to review revised language specifically and, you know, go through it, the, the scoping plan section by section um, in order to do that. Thank you so much. That's correct, Catherine. Um, we would definitely want to to try to improve on the processes as, as much as we can. And certainly if we had successful processes that, that folks like, we can uh, we can continue with those. And Commissioner Ball. Yeah, I just want to second the idea of these. This is a great process, I think, uh, to support our work, you know, bring in some experts. Um, I was recently able to spend five days in, in Washington with 50 other commissioners, secretaries, and directors of AG, and met with Secretary Vilsack and met with some undersecretaries with responsibilities in this regard. Threw them under the bus, and uh, they very willing to come and offer their thoughts and help us align with what's thinking in a lot of places. So I like this idea. I like the subgroup idea, and I like uh, letting people self select. First of all, and then, as Ann pointed mm -hmm. out, uh, you know, you got to right size a group. You, we can do that. So, great thinking. Uh, Peter, I see in the chat you have your hand up. Peter Alonowitz. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Yeah, I, I just want to um, agree with the, the self select and volunteering for this thing, but I also hope we can provide these over WebEx so the public can at least monitor the way they monitor council meetings um, today. I think, you know, level of transparency. So they understand who these quote experts are that we pulled in and can watch the, the subgroups meet. Yeah, and Peter, maybe I can address that a little bit. I think um, when we're talking about bringing in experts, at least my preference would be to uh, bring those experts to the full council and not just have it be to a, a smaller subgroup. Um, maybe it's the smaller subgroup that actually kind of uh, processes that information and then comes back to the council with a with um, options for recommendations. But um, certainly, we do want these to be transparent. But at the same time, want um, council members to feel comfortable enough uh, speaking their mind and and being you know honestly a little bit vulnerable. Like sometimes it can be uncomfortable to say I don't know about this, but this is my opinion, or to ask some questions. So. We'll certainly be looking to balance the transparency with, um, with I would say, the effectiveness of having subgroups. And so, if we um, ultimately chose not to have those televised, um, we would certainly need to 
um, have some sort of mechanism where there would be a report out either from those subgroups um, periodically or, um, you know, at the council meetings or we could post um, materials, whether it's it's minutes or summaries of, of the discussions, we could post those on the Climate Act website. This is, is Rose and I'm just, just want to second what Sarah said. Thanks, uh, and Dennis and Keisha. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to uh, respond to, you know, we use the word bias all the time. There's bias in this entire process, uh, to be honest. So let's, I like bias. Uh, I like subject matter experts. So if we're going to draw in experts, uh, let's make sure we pull them in. And how you counteract bias is you have an unbiased facilitator that is of equal technical level. So, so I don't want to rule out groups, um, you know, just because we feel they're biased. Uh, I just think that we, like, if you think about the utility consulting group that's out there, um, they're the ones that will be filing these um, uh, initiatives as we progress this. So is there a way to capture their input uh, in such a way uh, somebody like, let's say, for instance, the Brattle group would be that facilitator. So I don't want to get hung up on bias versus unbiased because I, I really think that'd be difficult to, to ascertain. Thank you uh, for that comment. And then Keisha. Hi, uh, yeah, I just, I wanted to um, really uh, strongly support what Sarah laid out. I think it's important that all of the council members get the same um, exposure to those experts and discussions, but I also felt when we had some of the smaller um, group meetings, it was a lot of um, productive conversation. And I know that there are some sticking points left to be discussed. And I think targeting uh, those discussions with the subgroup is a really great idea. So thank you. Well, great. I, Anne, uh, you have your hand up again, or no? Okay. And Raya, your hand was up. Is that again? Okay. Um, well, it sounds like we have, you know, a pretty strong comfort level with the idea of subgroups. So I think if we go now to the next slide, I'll sort of explain what I was hoping to do um, again in the service of this working plan. Um, what we would like to do is just get a better understanding from you about what specific questions you feel like are left unresolved. What issues are left unresolved that you want to have um, time to work on as a council, time to delegate to a subgroup, uh, time to just get more information about. And I, well, certainly nothing will be just information. So the council will need to deliberate on all these topics, but. Um, I'd like you to try to keep it again to, you know, just an open question and not, and not your position necessarily on that question as Sarah suggested, uh, but but just the questions you would like to see the council take take on, and with that, uh, if I could also ask you to to respond, you know, what information you think would be helpful if that's a specific analysis or sensitivity if it's a uh, a research, research or expert question that you want um, to bring into the process be good helpful if you identify that and not to the level of saying which expert but you know the type of information that would be helpful and finally you know what process do you think that this particular topic is best suited to is it full council uh, consideration with the additional information you need is it delegation to a subgroup I think those are two really the two sort of uh, approaches that are, we would just like to be able to understand better how to, how to actually put those into a work plan and start that movement early on um, in the process while you're waiting for the public input and uh, written comments to come in. So if I could, I'm not sure if you this is how you've done it before, but I'd just like to ask if each of you, as you speak, give me one, question and one answer to sort of the information and process you would prefer and then we'll go around until everybody's had an opportunity to speak and then we'll come back for uh, a second bite at that apple so that every you have enough if you have other questions that are still outstanding um so gavin let me start with you i'm 
sorry uh, for the delay. Um, sticking to your, your direction, I just would request that the chapter on gas transition and the scoping plan um, get a thorough review from PSC legal staff relative to the PSC statutory jurisdiction they have so that we're all on the same page about the definition of natural gas or fossil gas. And uh, I just want us to be accurate because this is a serious item. And uh, okay. that's my question. Thank you. And it sounds like you would like that to the public service commission to take that task on. And well, Catherine, if, if I may, uh, so Gavin, those uh, we are reviewing. Um, and uh, feedback will be provided when it's available. So uh, those questions will be answered. Thanks, Thank Lori. Appreciate it. Uh, Raya. I think, I think, I mean, speaking of definitions, you know, fossil gas, as, as Bob stated, is, you know, has been already kind of gone through all the churn of this process. But I think we need to consider the framing of this topic, um, um, not gas transition, not decarbonization of the gas system. Um, that to me is not a level set discussion um, and we've had this before, but um, I think we need to, you know, we need to be serious about the conversation that we're having. The IPCC says we have 10 years left to grapple with this problem before we will lose our ability to act. The window is closing. And so um, this isn't even a question, you know, that we need to answer. It's, it's a suggestion or a request that we revisit the, the name of this discussion. Hmm. Um, That's, well, it it's interesting when I was reading through the scoping plan in preparation for this meeting, I noticed that it, it calls for the council to create a framework for a, I think that I should look at the specific wording, but uh, develop a framework for a strategic plan to downsize the fossil gas system. So that was one of the tasks that was sort of laid open. Down, downsize is definitely, we had a lot of discussion. Don't like that one either. Go downsize. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So words are important. Um, yes, can I move to uh, Donna and then Paul Shepson? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'd have a number, but I'll stick with one question because that's what thank you, you asked us to do. Um, and I and I guess the question would be, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a question and a comment if that's okay. So the question would be, what what have others done in other parts of the state? I'm sorry, other parts of the country, other and other countries um, on this topic. Um, so best practices about decarbonizing and reducing emissions and how the gas system, um, the role that it plays. So that's, I think that's a question that um, we need to, to take a look at the results from other jurisdictions and other places. Um, and I guess my comment is, I don't feel like we had consensus. My comment really pertains to this whole chapter. You know, it was not a, a specific advisory panel. There wasn't, you know, in depth study on it. So I feel this is an area where I feel like we really need expertise beyond that, which we have here. And I think the PSC, I appreciate um, chair uh, Christian's comments and, and Gavin's question. I think the, the, you know, utilities need to be involved too. I think we need experts on this subject. I don't I don't think it, it was given enough um, depth and I and I don't think we had a consensus, certainly not mine, that there's a presumption of downsizing the system. That's that's I think the, the lack of consensus you're seeing, Catherine. So thank you. So you've you've identified both sort of an information need of best practices. It could be just a targeted, uh, perhaps a targeted uh, piece of work by some state staff. You've you've also, or or perhaps a technical contractor, as well as more of an in-depth uh, analysis of, and I, I can imagine that, that that has a number of sub-questions to it that you might wanna have answered. 
uh, as well as a lot more time for the for the council to simply deliberate and uh, reach a more of a consensus on what this whole framework looks like. While I have you, can I ask you if you see this as something that would be appropriate for a subgroup to take on as a starting place? I think it'd be a good starting place personally. And, um, and I think you also said it, the framework, you know, in, in chapter 18, it talked about a framework. It talked about DPS leading an effort. I don't think this can be uh, assessed here at a council. I just don't think it can be. I think it's going to be a longer process. So, yes, yes. An answer to your question. Thanks. Thank you. So, a number of other people, Paul, and then Bob, and then Ann. I'll just comment in sequence here. Uh, it, it strikes me that it's not possible to meet the goals of the Climate Act without significantly downsizing the natural gas system in New York State. But that's not why I raised my hand. Uh, when thinking about gas transition, or uh, you know, if what we mean by that is downsizing in the rate, and reminded by Raya and the IPCC about the urgency of the time frame, to me, it's all about financing and economics. And so, my question is about whether we have a sort of matching financial plan. That goes along with with our temporal goals of decreasing various aspects of the greenhouse gas emissions that go along with our energy management. Um, there really needs to be a, a clearly defined uh, financing plan. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an area that we've spent relatively little time on, and to me, it's it's the biggest hurdle. Um, that's my comment. Very good points. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to look at that both within this specific topic, and it also comes back up, um, as Sarah noted, under economy wide approaches, where those might be one source of revenue for some of the, the um, various recommendations throughout the report. Bob, and then Ann. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay. Let me just start by saying that chapter 18 aside, there are many chapters in the draft and implementation plan that, that uh, clearly show that we need to move away from using fossil fuels and towards beneficial electrification as, as our heating needs. That's, that's a paramount aspect of, of, of the plan. And so to me, the question is you know, uh, what twofold. I'm going to make it into a two, two questions. Sorry about that. But one is, uh, you know, as we decarbonize home heating, we still need to maintain a uh, gas infrastructure system that is safe and reliable for those customers who are still dependent on it. Mm -hmm. and, and that goes to Paul's point. It's it's part of the the financing, but it's beyond financing. It's, uh, you know, if we just put a, a a broad context on it. If we allow individual homeowners statewide to decide if and when they want to make a switch, then you have to maintain a very, very expensive gas system. You know, at one point, say by 2040, it might only be serving 10% of the customers of today, and yet you'd need all of the same safety protocols, et cetera. That's very expensive. So, you know, it's, as part of the plan, is this something we should do community by community or street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood, as opposed to just individual homeowners deciding statewide. So that's that's uh, the question I would have is, you know, the implementation plan, how how do we really uh, make this work on a geographical sense as well as the financial? But the, the other question, and I, I apologize, it's, it's two. Uh, there are some uh, individuals out in the world who say that a gas infrastructure system, even when you're no longer using it for natural gas, and I think We've agreed as a council that we will not be using natural gas after, say, 2045 or so. There are some who say, well, it could serve other purposes. Uh, personally, I, my, my reading says that's not true, but it poses as a question. Is there a role for a natural gas pipeline system that no longer moves natural gas? Okay. Perfect. Those are actually exactly the types of questions that are, that are helpful. To know, um, and Anne, I think you're next. 
So, you know, I went back and looked at the end of chapter 18 and, and our assignment here is to come up with a framework for the orderly downsizing in of the gas system in the final scoping plan. So if I had to boil it down to one question, it would be what's the what's the role of state government and when? Um, and I see it as two, you know, two ends of that decision making spectrum would be that the state focuses exclusively on building renewable electricity and electrifying buildings, and then that way displacing the need for the gas system, um, or also focuses on assertively downsizing, closing, decommissioning the gas system. And, um, and when, you know, like maybe it's focusing exclusively on one for 10 years and then turning to the other. So in turn, I, I would assume, guess, that the framework would have to answer that question. What's the state's role and, and when would it be doing one or the other of those activities? Thanks. I mean, and you're, you're, I think, just reiterating the other thing that I'm hearing here, which is that they go hand in hand. You have to understand the timing and the phasing of both in order for it to be effective and um, economically viable. Um, Dennis. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so, I guess I'm the dog with the bone here, but uh, what questions would I ask on a gas transition is what is the corresponding impact on the electric distribution system in the context of capacity and resiliency? And then what information, uh, just the current state of the electric distribution system, especially in our inner cities? So could you, if you would, could you just repeat the second part of that? What information? Which the second part, the information we need is the current state of the electric distribution system, current especially state, okay. in our inner cities. Right. So sort of a, what is the current status of the infrastructure? Current state, state, <coughs> condition, et cetera. Okay, um, so Donna, I promised I'd give you a, a second chance people that had a second question. So if you have a second question, let's raise that. And then I'm going to sort of close this out and go to the next 1. Thank you and, and mine was very similar to Dennis's. I'll try to phrase it differently. It, it really is. How is the gas system transition tied or connected to the electric distribution system readiness? And that really would be as granular as, you know, neighborhood level. It's, it's, it's similar, but it's a little different. Um, how, how does it connect to readiness? Great. Um, so I'm not going to try to, to summarize all of that, but I, I do want, uh, to see if others, if you had 1, uh, I think Donna, you said you thought this was. A topic that could well. Be jump started with a subgroup. Uh, do other? Is, let me put it this way: Is any anybody else who, particularly those who raised specific questions, not would you not feel comfortable if a subgroup took this on as a starting starting place on this discussion? Answer some of these questions. I guess. Could, could you clarify again exactly what what we'd be comfortable with or not comfortable with? Yeah, that was kind of a, a, a double negative, I think. Um, so. Um, Donna had suggested that this might be a topic that is well suited to a subgroup of the council uh, starting the process or starting the conversation. Does anybody not feel comfortable with a subgroup? Do you feel like a subgroup is not the way to start this process this, or answering these questions? Which would mean it basically it would come up to the full council. I see hands up. I don't know if that means that. Uh, if folks could just lower your hand, if you don't have an additional. Got lots of hands are, those, are these questions or are you saying you're comfortable or you're not comfortable? I guess maybe I'll Raya, your hand went up. What, what, what are you thinking right now? I am comfortable, but we, we, we've had this discussion about, you know, what this should be called and I just would want it to conform to, you know, to the language and the mandate that's in the. The draft scoping plan. 
So I am going to take no voices raised uh, as the fact that generally people are feeling okay if this were to be a subgroup. So we, as I said, we'll bring back kind of a proposal about what that would look like and how that might be timed um, or phased into the process uh, overall uh, on the next, next meeting. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go on to the next topic, which I believe is, if you go to the next slide, advanced fuels. Um, so advanced fuels, um, as I understand it, is, is basically um, green hydrogen and renewable natural gas. Um, if there are other fuels that, that should be captured in this conversation, please let me know. But I uh, want to pose the same set of questions to you, uh, which is, what more do you need to know or what questions do you feel are left unresolved about the role of advanced fuels overall in the, in the uh, scoping plan? And what information or process would be appropriate for taking on those questions? So I am going to uh, go back to the hands I see raised, uh, Paul Shepson and Gavin. Have your hand up. Mine is a legacy. If my okay. hand is up, sorry. Yep, it's still up, Gavin. Do you have something you wanted to add on yeah, this? Topic? I'm sorry. Uh, what is the decision making process that we're going to uh, incorporate in the state to determine what those fuels are? Um, zero emission technologies is where we're supposed to land under the law. We need to determine what those zero emission technologies are. And there's various forums to do it and we need to, uh, we need to recognize that. Thank you. So what is the decision on how uh, zero emissions fuels are defined? I got that right. Yes. Okay. Uh, Ann? So um, on this topic, uh, I guess I'm really sort of answering the second question here, but I have a suggested process. Um, you know, on the one hand, you have like the, the fault solutions report that was issued and a lot of strong feelings about hydrogen and renewable natural gas. And then I think there's also some use cases that would be agreeable to, I, I think, I'm not sure about this, but that would be agreeable to nearly everyone. And so I think it would help us decide if there was defined use cases for advanced fuels. So it would range from say, collecting methane that's already being produced at landfills and, and sewage treatment plants and using it for onsite heat and electricity generation or green hydrogen production with renewable energy that would already otherwise be curtailed versus other types of, of renewable natural gas use cases, such as in pipelines that in, and sort of define those use cases and create a hierarchy for them, um, like the waste hierarchy of, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle and, and proper disposal. So, because I think there's a range of of technology and uses, and when we talk about them all together, we'll never agree with each other. So I think it might help folks to identify the ones that they think are good, medium, bad, if they were defined that way. That's my suggestion. Great suggestion. And I guess my question back to you is, is this something that you think that the full council could take on as just a, a, a sort of a threshold question to resolve? Well, actually, I think there would be some discussion involved in defining the use cases. I mean, I guess the, the, the staff could come back to the council and say, here are the use cases and here's our suggested hierarchy. That would be mm -hmm. one approach. Maybe it, maybe it doesn't need a subgroup or it could also be discussed in a subgroup. I, I probably would leave that to people who have stronger opinions than me about that process question. Um, so I'm going to jump to um, Thomas Falcone. I haven't heard from you yet, so I'm going to give you a chance to speak up. Sure. Yeah, just a couple of observations. I guess in my mind, the, this question of advanced fuels and 
say hydrogen, for example, is somewhat related to the prior question of uh, use of the gas system. I mean, one of the questions is, can that transmission and distribution system for the gas system be reused? Is it purposeful? Um, I don't think uh, I'm the only one that has that question in my mind. Bob mentioned it. Uh, I would make a second observation, uh, which is our ability to actually reach final conclusions on these in this time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not dealing with, you know, the ability of the Climate Action Council to spend as much time on this as possible. I think it's the, the real problem is that technology isn't a constant and some of these things uh, will develop over time. There are a lot of pilots on, for example, hydrogen and using, uh, say, offshore wind to make hydrogen and then using that uh, for such an essential use case as the grid itself. Our own integration analysis calls for 20 gigawatts of, uh, of a placeholder, long duration storage, and one of the potential options is, say, hydrogen. So we know we need something, but we don't know if hydrogen's the answer or other forms of long duration storage will develop. You know, there's some things that we know we need it, but we know, and we know we need it by 2040 to make the electric grid work, but we're not going to be able to answer the question of what the right technology is today. Uh, I would say in a different context, we started this meeting talking about offshore wind and um, LIPA signed a contract for offshore wind in 2017. If you had asked me, would there be 20 gigawatts of commitments for offshore wind in 2022? I would have thought you would, you know, we're just kidding, you know? Um, so things change, technology changes, and sometimes we hit, you know, points where uh, technology not only changes, they hit their stride and suddenly, you know, the world is a different place. Trying to predict technology curves for 20 years out is, is not something that's known or knowable. And where we're probably going to end up is just trying to categorize what we can know today, what we do have to decide today and make directionally uh, consistent and directionally correct uh, assumptions and then also leave it to future councils on some of these things because I don't I don't think you're going to know whether hydrogen's the fuel of the future or not and whether the you know we're going to use the pipes you know the natural gas pipes or whatever there's just way too many yeah. uncertainties there okay and I think that's something that um, yes and, and this isn't the only issue where there are those types of technology uncertainties that that have to be grappled with so I I think your point is well taken and it's something the council is going to have to take up in how it it frames its recommendations. Um, so I want to Peter, your hand is up in the chat and you usually have to go last because I don't see it. So go ahead and jump in. That's okay. Thanks, Catherine, for recognizing it. Um, and maybe just to add to a point that Ann made um, just moments ago and, and, and argue for this maybe being a, a, a place where work groups um, could be helpful is there's a lot of inconsistencies with, in particular, renewable natural gas throughout the plan and some things that probably need to be seriously looked at to modify those inconsistencies. So part of it is the hierarchy, I, you know, I agree with Ann, but also I think the council should spend some time looking at the inconsistencies between sections as to how we consider renewable natural gas if we do it all. Okay, good. And good a quick editorial comment. I know we don't want to adjudicate issues here, but I hope we consider advanced fuels as stuff we don't have to burn. Um, and maybe Catherine, I could just jump in here too, based on um, Tom Falcone's response here. I just want to clarify that. Um, well, well, a lot of the discussion is around um, gas um, for power generation or for heating that we also are um, intending this subject to be a discussion that would include, you know, liquid transportation fuels as well and not just hydrogen and RNG just to to help clarify Thanks. here. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm going to come back up to to Bob. Uh, let you jump in and then and go down to uh, Don and Raya. Thank you, and I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. I mean, I, I agree totally with what Anne, Tom, and, and Peter have just said. And, you know, picking up on Peter's point, I, I do think we need to just strive for some consistency across our chapters. And But with what Tom, it, it's uh, these technologies, many of them are, are pretty immature, and so it's hard to judge exactly where they're going to go. What I think the council should do is, is provide some guidance as to the, 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 
the boundaries, the guardrails within which we might find things acceptable moving forward. So the question, Peter's question of, of to burn or not to burn, you know, I broaden that a little bit. You know, what uh, what sort of uh, uh, emissions would be acceptable? If, if you could burn it with zero emissions, maybe it's okay. That's probably not possible. But we could make statements of that sort as a council, and and therefore, you know, if we're going to use hydrogen in the future, should it just be through fuel cells? Well, based on what I know at the moment, I think so. But that technology could change in ten years, as as Tom has pointed out. So perhaps the guidance should be that you know, to the extent you're using these fuels. Uh, we want to use them as efficiently as possible and with and with zero emissions and we and we're firm on, on that as guidelines that that's how i would suggest we we pose these uh, um, questions thank you thank you that's that's good clarification um uh, let me take raya and donna and then wrap this up all right thank you very much so i i thought um uh certainly agree with many of the comments that came before in particular bobs i like that approach of looking at the boundaries while we can look at hierarchies i do not think we should be looking at use cases um and i think we also we've got we understand through the plan we've got options we've got one that goes away from combustion we know the role for these fuels are going to be minimal um so i just i we don't want to expand the conversation and the uses, especially for experimental technologies beyond sort of what the place that the common understanding that we have already, although we do need to look very seriously at clearing up those inconsistencies. And this is also a place where we're going to want to have consultation with the climate justice working group. Mm -hmm. um, Donna. Thank you, Catherine. I, I think my um, my suggestions were, were pretty much aligned with um, CEO Falcones, and that really is how do we how do we assess the best practices for these sorts of fuels? So whether it be renewable natural gas or green hydrogen, I'll just stick stick with those two. You know, what is the latest uh, best uh, research on how to use these sources for greenhouse gas reductions? And I think there's a lot of I, I know, uh, Raya, I think you just said you didn't like the, the concept of use cases, but but there are use cases out there that that I, I would like to see us um, see and consider. Um, Ontario is doing green hydrogen blending right now um, and using it for heating. So 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 that's that, that's the question for me. Thank you. Okay, I'm hearing kind of a consistent theme that there is there is work to be done to to uh, think about. First of all, maybe. Clearly defining what falls within the, an acceptable category for advanced fuels, uh, whether or not that technology might be available now or in the future, and and how those, um, again, what are the some of the best uses? Um, there seems to be a little mixed feeling about that, but if nothing else, then what would be the end result of uses uh, so in terms of emissions um, that is acceptable to the overall council? Um, Anybody have any strong feelings about whether or not you want to take some of these questions up with the full council to begin or a subgroup? You would like to delegate that to a subgroup. I think I heard a little bit of both. Not really strong feelings one way or the other. I would think the subgroup of the interested might be a good place to, to start and then bring recommendations back to the council, at least my vote. Okay, I heard also that, you know, the staff might have some input on that. Yeah, I agree with that and I, and I don't know again, if we could bring experts, but I really think there's so much expertise outside of, you know, outside of the council on this as well. I mean, certainly within the council, but also outside of the council that would be beneficial. You got 2 main investors. You got uh, Lindy that's investing major dollars in this issue. You've got plug power, uh, you know. Let's tap into the, the the expertise that's out there. They're not doing it uh, just for they have nothing better to do. So they so let's take advantage of what's out there and gather that information as part of our discussion. Okay, so yeah. bringing more expertise to the council um, as a whole, as well as perhaps uh, charging a subgroup with starting to look at sort of what the different options are for for use and. Um, technologies. 
All right, let's move to the next and final one. Um, I did have, I'm, we, we thought we might actually introduce a, a break. Uh, we're getting close to the end here. So I don't know if folks uh, would like to have a five minute break before we continue. We're gonna have a conversation about economy wide and then we wanna touch on sort of the decision-making process as the last topic for today. Um, I'm happy to give everybody literally a few minutes. I'm, I, if you promise to come back, because this is an important topic, but now seems like a good time. If you need to take a, a few minutes just to um, stretch your legs, run to the bathroom, get some water. So why don't we do that? And I'm gonna, um, I know you, this isn't typical, but I'm gonna ask if you, everybody could be back here uh, literally in, in can, five minutes, five minutes. Um, so about 25 after, according to my clock, and we're going to start right on time. Thanks.
Okay, so if I could ask folks to um, get back in a comfortable seat and we'll jump into the next topic. All right, so let's go on uh, economy-wide approach. Um, so this, in the scoping plan, there um, is a lot of discussion about uh, several different approaches to uh, carbon cap and trade, carbon pricing, uh, fuel standards. Um, and so I guess that just to open it up, um, my understanding that there really is, it wasn't any final um, consensus around any of those. Um, so what, what specific questions do you think the, the council should take up and how would you like to have, start that? How would you like to, what kind of information, what process would you like to use? Uh, are you, Catherine? It's Gavin, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I wasn't Can you hear me okay? Is Tom back? Catherine, can you right. hear me? About I can hear you, Gavin. Five. Catherine, are you hearing us? I thought she called me, Sarah, but maybe I'm wrong. Problem with taking breaks is we don't get people back quite on time. I'm not sure if all of these hands were just left up or. Um, Tom, have you rejoined? Have you rejoined? Do you have anything to add about the economy wide approach? Nope. Hand went down. Raya. Yes, I have a, a lot of things to add. I'm also interested to hear um, what other folks um, think here. Um, I'll be interested to hear what folks think in terms of, of process, but- Raya, you're muted. Oh, really? You're not muted. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, no, you're not. We can hear you, Raya. We can hear My you. problem. I just didn't have, I'm sitting here talking without my earbuds <laughs> in. That's why nobody could hear me. Sorry. Oh, so sorry. sorry. And that's the- That's so how Raya. Uh, all right, sorry from the beginning. Uh, so sorry. What to hear what folks have to say about process. I've got a lot of things to say here. The first is I know we probably need an update um, from the state and the consulting um, team. They were, you know, they've been so fantastic. And my understanding from the end of last year is that they were really looking at a number of tools, a number of different analyses, a number of different models and approaches. And I'd love to hear sort of what has come up and what they've, you know, put together there. And I'm interested to know how they think the analysis that was done on the clean energy standard incentive program might, you know, that, that I know was done at one point, um, the federal program might line up. This is another area where we're going to need to consult very closely, closely with the um, climate justice working group. And then specifically when we get to sort of the type of questions we need to answer, um, I think one very important one is how will we account for um, both how the money is raised um, and its impacts and how it's spent. How can we make sure that we have community-based approaches and community-based programs that are deeply involved um, in this, in these approaches, um, where traditionally a lot of the traditional carbon pricing, um, revenue neutral type approaches do not have that. So I think that um, that you know. So the one thing is sort of an update, um, you know, from from the state and from the consultants, um, and then this. Other very, uh, you know, the climate justice working group is important, as is this idea of how can we make sure that community based approaches are in are included in the context of any um, pricing scheme. Last, I'll say, how can we absolutely make sure um, that any approach, you know, fo flows through to our floor um, for our 40%, you know, disadvantaged communities? A piece, so we need to make sure we have analyses that reflect that. Um, so, so you may need to parse. There are some comments, there are some questions, and then some asks mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. team. No, but a great start. 
great start. Um, can I go back to Gavin? I'm, I apologize for not having my uh, no problem. Your phone's uh, in. Not a problem. Uh, I, I think the first I have two two questions. Um, you know, what are the affordability measures for consumers so where we can reduce upfront costs for folks that have to to do things uh, at their homes or other aspects of their lives to comply with this law? What is what are the prospects of the affordability? The second issue is is carbon pricing. What more needs to be done to move that forward? Uh, we have been debating carbon pricing on the wholesale generation side for four to five years. Um, we need to move forward on putting a price on carbon and what is, what is needed to make that happen. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Rory and then Ann. Thank you, Catherine. So um, I, I think it's important to first point out, um, you know, we've had a number of discussions about uh, terminology, um, you know, what we're going to be doing to decommission the natural gas system and whatnot. Uh, but I do want to highlight for this group that ultimately the public service law still heavily favors the provision and installation of natural gas service to customers throughout the state. Um, there are numerous instances in the law that still favor this, and that remains unchanged despite the language in the CLCPA. So I do want to flag that for everyone's attention as something to be cognizant of. And that said, I think one thing that's worth our review is understanding how those laws affect what we are trying to accomplish. And also, what can we do to provide new language, new laws, new direction that puts us along the path towards achieving these outcomes? Um, I know Paul mentioned earlier that it's all about financing, and I wholeheartedly agree. I think financing will play a very significant role in what we're able to do. But I, I also feel that the legal language around the provision of gas and other services will be just as important in the direction that we go and the type of financing and resources that we're going to bring to bear to achieve this outcome. So I think a legal review of uh, what changes would be needed to achieve the desired effects, and that could very well include discussions on um, uh, cap and trade, carbon tax, whatever you wanna, what that terminology language you wanna use. Um, so those are my two cents for the moment. Thank you. Thanks. So there's. Sounds like you're pointing out a, a significant barrier to any uh, some of the policies that you might or programs you might want to support if you had the revenue or if you wanted to impose a, a um, some type of economy wide approach. Well, to to be clear, not just barrier potentially, but also opportunity. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I want to for everyone's information, the natural gas system didn't pop up overnight. It has grown exponentially mm -hmm. uh, since it's. Uh, creation and that's largely been as a result of language in the public service law encouraging the use of natural gas both for residential use and industrial and commercial use um, so if we want to transition away that is a place we should examine if we want to accomplish a similar goal in a different direction great okay thanks for the clarification and um what would you like to add in so uh, I had to go back and refresh my memory about this chapter two and see as well, chapter 17. Um, and it tees up nicely. Here's the three options. Here's the criteria we should look at and whatever we pick, here's what we, how we, sh what we should define about it. So I think the next step is to apply all those criteria to the three options, um, which would be easy to do qualitatively. But um, the question we need to answer is if we're going to do it quantitatively as, as the council or the state staff. You know, as Gavin points out, carbon pricing at the ISO, for example, has gone through several quantitative analysis. Um, others that are options have as well. So I think a threshold question is, and I think this is what Raya was getting at, because I believe when Carl was presenting the integration analysis a few months back, he explained that it can't do a quantitative analysis of these carbon pricing measures, but they would maybe look into some models that could. So I think 
uh, a threshold question is, are we going to do a quantitative analysis on the different carbon economy wide strategies to compare them to each other? Or is that going to not be something that we do this year before the plans final? Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, Donna and then Paul. Thank you, Catherine. And I think, um, my question aligns with others um, relative to the quantitative analysis and maybe affordability that, that was raised by others. So, so my question really was what, what impact would the economy wide measures have on uh, consumer energy affordability? And, and that, that really, you know, whether it be low, moderate income consumers, disadvantaged communities, um, different sectors, residential, commercial manufacturing. Thank you. And would you wrap that? Affordability question into also how the revenues are used to perhaps address that. Definitely a component of it for sure. Um, great addition and Paul, let's move to you. Just, just a quick comment. I, you know, I, I find an awful lot of our conversations highly sobering. Given the urgency of the situation and the urgency laid out by the scoping plan in terms of the timing uh, about things like converting heating systems in a mega city like new york city from natural gas and, and community boilers to to uh, heat pumps it is um it, it is just an astoundingly complex process and i feel like this economy wide approach needs to involve producing a roadmap that that at least attempts to def to to answer questions like what is the expected role of New York state government in financing and developing financial models for achieving the goals what is the expected role of the private sector and if we need to develop I'm sure we do public private partnerships in this process, how do we do that? And what is the role of this process in in developing such public private partnerships? Uh, I, again, I just don't think we've spent much time on this incredibly important issue. Mm -hmm. So wrapping in a better understanding of how uh, either this or other mechanisms could be used, including state funding um, from other sources and private funding could be used to finance the major investments that are needed, as well as addressing some of the affordability questions. Um, so where am I? Um, Raya, uh, Tom, and then Dennis. Or did I skip somebody? I apologize. Great. I was just going to add one thought. You know, Gavin asked, for example, you know, we've been debating carbon pricing at the NISO for five years. What's it take? And I think that that, that illustrates something, though, just how, in theory, something that sounds good, carbon pricing and NISO markets, when you get into the practical implementation details and who wins and the considerations, just how complex these things can be, you know, some of the issues at the NISO included, well, you know, it's kind of a windfall to certain generators, to existing renewables that are already under contract, to hydro, to nuclear, you know, in who pays, what do you do with the money, what do you do about seams and border issues? So something that sounds like a no-brainer, of course, we should do carbon pricing. When you start to do the analysis and you, the more layers of the onion you peel back, the more considerations you have. I mean, one of the things I noticed from that NISO analysis, as we've debated it the last five years, is when you look at the dollars paid by consumers per, you know, ton of carbon reduced, it's actually quite high. You know, so it doesn't look, you know, because there's so much leakage, it doesn't look like quite the no-brainer that it would seem. So there's just a lot of really complex uh, issues uh, around it that, in theory, it just seems like a no-brainer and we should just get it over with. So, I mean, I think that raises a question that, that the council will have to decide about how far you down that uh, list of very detailed implementation questions you're likely to go, um, or if there is that's something that you're going to have to defer to a later process. Um, you know, by 
sort of coming together on sort of the generalities, uh, or can you do that without knowing all those detailed implementation uh, decisions? I, it, this is Rose, and I know I'm talking out of turn, but I, I, but I have had my hand up for a really, really long Already time. Um, is, uh, it, uh, it, it seems to me that we probably, this is where we need experts that can be there uh, to kind of, uh, I, I don't know, condense the, you know, I, it, I know, Thomas, you said, well, when you go down into the layers, it's a whole different story. It could be a whole different story, but we can't, we can't get down into that level of detail. So when we deliver it, I mean, all these questions are good. Our experts who have done a bunch of analysis need to be there to kind of condense the numbers for us um, and all of the considerations with the numbers. So I, I just think, how, how do we go forward? I think we definitely need the number crunchers there for the overall view for each of these questions with all the caveats that go with it as you dig down into the complexity of it. Mm -hmm. And that is something um, I think that, that we can come back to you with about, you know, what studies have been done and what, you know, what are the options for bringing I don't think new new analysis necessary, but no, no new analysis. The, yeah, the information that's already been been um, uh, the analysis and information that's already been put together. Exactly, um, is use what has already been done specifically for us or other studies, but somebody that can condense it. Yep. Partic you know, to the particular questions. So, Dennis, I don't think. You've had a chance to add on this particular topic. Yeah, I just, I just want to kind of like, you know, also think about what are market opportunities that are out there? What are opportunities for the energy consumer to, uh, to get involved? So I'd like to understand kind of what are other regulatory or business models that we need to explore uh, to advance these opportunities, such as virtual power plants that are mentioned in the governor's state of the state, uh, microgrids. Uh, forward thinking non wires alternatives or DER in general, distributed energy resources in general. And then really thinking about uh, ownership models, different ownership models, whether it's the community developers or even the utility in, in, in cases that uh, there's no market that's willing to take that uh, opportunity or chance. Thanks for that. Um, I. Um... I'm hearing at least that there's there is definitely some um, expertise and um, gathering of additional of current analysis that needs to be brought to the council uh, to maybe help clarify the, the some of these questions that are being um, asked right now. Maybe that's the first step in this case, um, and then a decision of, as to whether or not you wanted to move this to a subgroup. Um, I want to make sure I have I can take a. a few more minutes to see if there's any other specific questions. Um, and, and a lot of the hands are people that have already spoken. So let me just ask um, uh, Rory, Paul, Rose, and Anne, you all have your hands still up. Could you just put them down if you don't have another question and I'll. Um, sorry about that. No problem. So Anne, do you still have another question? I did actually still have another okay. question or comment right. on it, but what was the last thing you said, Catherine, that would be a likely first step? Um, I was suggesting the possibility of bringing in um, an expert who could review the analyses that have already been done on the three approaches that are discussed at length in the scoping plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I would echo that, that having a, a matrix of the options and then the criteria and then any quantitative analysis that's, that's already been done um, would be would be helpful, I think, to, to look at it that way and compare the ways that these are the same and different. Um, what I was going to say was maybe a statement of the obvious that the, the, 
the challenge in doing a, a quantitative analysis of these is it all all depends on the the carbon price that you choose. You know, if you make the carbon price one dollar or one hundred dollars, that changes how they all come out. And um, I don't know. May, maybe others will disagree with me. It doesn't strike me as a particularly great thing for a subgroup to try to set those assumptions um, or even construct the matrix comparing the different options. I I guess I'm, I'm sort of putting this back on, on you guys and the state staff, but I think presenting that information to the group and then deciding whether it's, it's, it's um, I don't think a subgroup could decide like, okay, here's how we're going to do the quantitative analysis and, and here's how we're not going and here's what we're going to set the carbon price out. I think that has to be something that relies on all the consultants and then we respond to it. Okay. Okay, that's great. Um, and Raya, your hand went back up. Yeah, I just wanted to, I agree with, um, you know, I like Anne's suggestion. I just wanted to uplift again, um, Chair Christian's comments about the need to have a <laughs> in this matrix um, to have that, you know, what are the law and policy, you know, changes that need to happen in order to, um, you know, in, in order to further these plans. Okay, well noted. Um, with that, I'm going to turn to the last piece that I wanted to touch on before we move to the next steps. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, and, and thank you all. This has been a great discussion in terms of helping us think about what actually needs to go into a work plan, how much time it might take, who we might bring in to, to help provide the information you've asked for, and how we might at least give you some, some um, draft language around charging a subgroup, and then we can maybe get those off and running. Okay, Catherine, um, sorry. It's Peter Arwanowitz here. I'm going to chime in. Yeah, I Peter. had a chat version of my hand. My Thing isn't working. I missed it. Widget. Go ahead. Um, I, I, a threshold question for economy wide um, strategies, if you will. Um, I'm wondering if we could add into this, whether it's a subgroup or the full council doing it, um, an examination of whether we view economy wide strategies in lieu of sector by sector regulations that the agencies should adopt to control the emissions or in concert with. Um, I have my own sort of feelings on that one, but I, you know, as you read the chapter, there's some bullets sort of laid out the beginning, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure whether, you know, we've you know, discussed that at a council or come to an agreement that we view, you know, economy wide strategies and pricing as a way to, um, you know, deal with, you know, all the different things that are in the plan, they're going to need resources. You know, every chapter has, we need money, we need resources, local governments need this. But do we view an economy-wide strategy, such as something like in a carbon tax, as a way uh, to be in lieu of regulating the emission sources and to achieve the emissions reductions through that pricing mechanism? Or do we view this as a way to pay for it? Mm -hmm. I'd like that to be kind of either a threshold question. I that yeah. I think deals with or we deal with the council. Yep. A great, great addition. Um, and Catherine, if I may, just to kind of piggyback off Pete was going to say, he interestingly enough touched on something related to what I wanted to mention. Um, you know, I, I want to reinforce what I was saying earlier and add a, a specific uh, reason why I think understanding the direction of public policy can influence the outcomes that we're going to do. You know, we signal a lot of things through public policy um, and having a firm signal on what we anticipate the grid looking like, the gas system looking like, what homes we'll be using for heating and so on and so forth. Um, that's backed with a law or, or at least a signal from the legislator or the public service law, whatever it may be, that in and of itself can drive a great deal of progress and innovation in driving particular outcomes. So I just want to kind of re-stress that particular point and the value of that. And Peter, to, to amplify what you were saying um, at the state level, um, just thinking back to my days doing energy efficiency with the New York City Housing Authority, I, I want to double down on what you said and say that's doubly important, making sure that uh, what one entity is doing for a particular outcome, may it be geographic or sectoral, doesn't bump up against something that's happening economy-wide. There has to be synergy between the two. They have to work together um, and potentially amplify each other to driving a particular outcome. So great point. 
Appreciate that. Um, and I get, I should just, I forgot to say that, you know, this does not have to be the end of this conversation in terms of um, other questions that you may have had on your mind. You didn't have a chance to voice. Please do forward those to Sarah. Uh, and she'll make sure that they get into the mix and we, we take those into consideration as we're thinking about this, this work plan. So, uh, don't be shy, go ahead and send any additional questions. Uh, and, and please link that if you would to the w information you would need to answer the question and, and that question about, uh, the best process. That would be helpful. So, just to wrap kind of this, this up uh, in terms of. The process, we thought it would be helpful just to touch on the decision making process, which. Um, I guess I'd start with in the next slide with just the assumption that. Um, we're making that the. Preference is that the council reaches. Its decisions through agreement or consensus. Um, and I think that needs a little bit more. Um, explanation because we may not all understand or agree on what that agree about what consensus actually is. Um, so let me just throw out what how I as a facilitator in building consensus with with, with groups, how I typically define it and, and you can uh, give me your reaction if, it, if it's not sitting well with you. Um, typically, we like to ask groups, first of all, to be thinking about a package of recommendations when they reach consensus. So you're working through a huge number of strategies and uh, implementation stra implementation actions in the scoping plan. And what we hope is that at the end of the day, we will be kind of taking a sense of the group about if you're in agreement about the package as a whole, the scoping plan as a whole, which means in reality that nobody gets everything that they want um, and but that they feel like that the plan overall has addressed their most important interests um, and that's where sort of the negotiation come comes into play um, through a facilitated deliberation you know you you're going to you're going to be able to have the chance to raise the concerns you have about specific uh, strategies specific actions definitions, the whole gamut. Um, and the hope is that through those deliberations, you all can get to a place where you feel like you're comfortable enough um, and that the things that are most important to you, you're very comfortable with. Um, so I'll leave it there for the moment. And I, I did want to touch on some of these uh, bullets here, which I know will resonate with all of you. Um, I don't want to sound preachy when I go through it, but um, you know, these are things that, again, we tend to rely on when we're facilitating consensus building. Um, the importance of establishing ground rules that you all mutually agree to that will help really support respectful, a collaborative and inclusive dialogue throughout the process. I know you haven't done this yet, but I would strongly suggest and hope you'll make time to do something like that. Maybe at the beginning of your next meeting, so, you know, a list of and, and you, I know you've been in many of these meetings and you've seen many of these types of ground rules, but it's always good to have the group kind of agree to them together so that you feel mo more committed to them. Um, secondly, you know, embrace differences. Uh, you've already heard a lot of differences throughout the process. There are going to be many more. And as we get closer to, you know, really finalizing the report, the, you know, it's the stakes get a little higher. So I think the important thing to remember there is that understanding how people come to their particular values or their, their particular, um, positions on is really has an underlying reason. It's their experience, their knowledge, which may be very different from yours. But the benefit of that is by, you know, us taking the time in these deliberations to hear each other. Uh, there's, there's a real opportunity for us to come up with better shared solutions because you have a better understanding of why somebody has a certain um, way of looking at something. Building trust is, of course, something that uh, you've been doing 
and you'll need to continue to do. And I, you know, we use a pretty simple definition of what that means, which is say what you mean and mean what you say. I mean, I think being very honest in what your underlying interests are when you put forward a particular position or recommendation is going to help the process overall. Um, it helps that understanding uh, of each other, and it helps you also, you know, be able to really try to work in each other's uh, most important needs in the process. And of course, this whole thing is is uh, designed to be collaborative, and that means you know you build you're building these solutions together. So. To do that, um, you've got to meet not just your interests, but you've got to meet the interest, obviously, of, of everybody else. Um, and it's a give and take. It's not a compromise. We try to stay away from the word, the word compromise because that often entails in people's mind the idea of lowest common denominator. That's where we have to go in order to get this through. Hopefully, there's going to be some exchange throughout this process, um, and you'll be able to to really uh, reach solutions that are, you know, as, as we like to say, kind of increase the pie rather than divide it up. Um, so it's not about getting necessarily what everything you want, but trying to really find those solutions that meet the needs of the overall council, since you all represent constituencies and interests that are important here. I'm going to stop. Anybody has wants to reflect on that before we turn to next steps, but that's our really our last our last um, piece of the agenda today. Couple of hands up, and, and again, if anybody has a legacy hand, you can lower it. But Raya, you have your hand up, and Rory and Gavin. Raya, and sorry, and down. Uh, apologies. All right, and Gavin, your hand is up, but maybe mine is just you know um, decision making. And one of the things we talked about is gas transition, new technologies, funding. Um, the thing that is really important that we didn't talk today, and it sort of builds upon Rory's comment about the balancing act we have here. Um, what, you know, one of the things we haven't thought about or discussed is what is the sequencing of our priorities, the timing of the priorities, because you're talking about such a mammoth change to the electricity grid and the buildings and the transportation. Another topic should be how are we going to prioritize the plans? Uh, recommendations and the timing of them and balance it, it so that we don't overwhelm the people that we have to report to, but more importantly, we don't overwhelm the ratepayers and, and the consumers across New York State. So I just think um, the timing of these things is very important. Thank mm -hmm. you. So you're suggesting that that has to be built into some of this decision making um, when we look at the overall plan. All right, well, I'm going to turn it back to Sarah. Thanks very much for uh, giving me the time to work through this with you. Thank you, Catherine. If we could just go to the next slide, just to quickly wrap up here. Um, so what I have as um, some takeaways here are that we're going to take a look at the public comment period and hearings to explore the ability to address some of the points that were that were made here today regarding um, an additional hearing location. Uh, moving one or both of the virtual hearings and the length of the comment period. I'll also get around a, um, a sign up sheet for um, for council members to um, to let us know what hearings that they would like to attend um, so that we can plan accordingly. Um, and then. Um, Finally, I think uh, the other item, well, the other two big items are obviously the. Uh, reflecting taking all the information that we've heard back on these on these key topics and working it into um, into a work plan and um, and figuring out um, or making suggestions about how the subgroups could um, could potentially aid in that um, and so um, with that, I would just say thank you all for for your participation. I feel like this um, was very helpful, at least for me, in trying to help figure out the work plan for this year. And um, I appreciate um, everyone attending and 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 contributing as much as you did. 
Um, and with that, we, we really don't have a lot of time left, but if there are any remaining questions, I'd be happy to, um, to, to try to address those. Sarah, I just have a quick one. It takes us back to the beginning of the meeting, but it's not entirely clear to me how we're going to um, adjudicate the input that we got from the Climate Justice Working Group. There's several sections of the draft where it's mentioned, but as we were going through in our private sessions this fall as staff, it was sort of conveyed to us as council members that as the chapters were being written, people didn't feel like the council had discussed that. So can someone just remind me what the process is going to be to sort of incorporate the tremendous feedback we got from the climate justice working group and come to a landing point on that those some of those items so um so sure so one of the first things i'm going to do is um i think i'd mentioned that this at the beginning that we as staff have started to pull together um a document that shows where the council feedback where the climate justice working group feedback is contained within the plan and how it was addressed and in some cases as I also mentioned, um, it may have been documented, but it didn't necessarily modify a recommendation or a strategy within within the scoping plan. So the first step is to get that um, information to the council members as well as to the climate justice working group to just you know increase transparency of this is how we um, this is this is kind of where things stand currently. And then I think um, we need to have a conversation um, to determine how, how do we want, how does the council want to engage with the climate justice working group? And then kind of the flip side of that, how is the climate justice working group interested in engaging with the climate action council? And we can work to, um, to kind of com come up with a process that, that works for all of them. Um, and I don't know if anybody um, that's closer to the, the climate justice working group um, wants to say anything additional there, um, but but happy to to cede the floor to, to other folks. Thanks, Sarah, that's helpful. I just it was a little bit unclear. I mean, I know it was discussed at the, at the top, but I'm, I'm glad you wrapped it back around for us as the council, but also the participants from the public. Great, thanks, Peter. And uh, Gavin, I see you have a hand up. Maybe that's an old hand. <laughs> uh, Donna, do you have you have a hand up? Yeah, quick question. Did we talk sure. about council meeting dates or or did I miss that? I'm, I'm not sure if we did. So just wondering what we should be expecting there. I, I know you talked about frequency. Just wondered if we are looking at dates yet? We haven't um, identified dates yet. That's going to be another task um, for, <laughs> I'll, I'll make note of that, that we need to come back. Um, some of it will depend on the timing of, of how we can turn all of this around. And then of course, in April, we've got a pretty full schedule. So um, I would say stay tuned for that and, and we'll try to get um, uh, a poll out uh, soon to, to see what availability is. Got it, thank you. Yep. All right, and with that, um, thanks everyone for attending and um, we will we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care.